Adam, how would you like to turn into an idiot? Uh, I'm not sure I follow. For our new sponsor, Village Idiot Pub, the 5K. Oh, yeah. Village Idiot Pub in historic Cocoa Village is holding an event for the Children's Hunger Project called The Village Has Lost Its Idiot Again. The run is a 5K held right in front of Village Idiot Pub on Harrison Street in Cocoa. It's an event to raise money and awareness for the Children's Hunger Project. While you can run, you don't have to. You can walk, skip, or drink your way to the end. So bust out those costumes, bedazzlers, and sequins and get creative as there will be awards for the best dressed fool or idiot. The theme is Masquerade Ball. Also, you've heard them on Living Podcariously do a performance, as well as guesting on the Twisted Ten. Our friends of the podcasts, Hot Pink, will be performing for the Village Idiot at 7 p.m. This 5K is not a timed event. It's a fun run. It's really about having fun and raising some beers. I mean, money for the Children's Hunger Project. Village Idiot Pub has over 30 beers on tap, including ciders as well as Hefeweizen's, my favorite, hundreds of bottle choices, and a great selection of wine. So get your friends together for the run, then enjoy the board games, puzzles, and giant Jenga inside, as well as Hot Pink's performance. Jason and the rest of the staff are awesome and will take excellent care of you. Mention either one of our shows to the staff and get 10% off your tab. You can catch the entire cast from Living Pod Curiously as well as the Twisted 10 there on April 1st for this run. I'm thinking we should set up mics and let our listeners and the people at Village Idiot add some commentary. Ooh, that could be dangerous. <laughs> the Village Idiot run will be on April 1st, directly in front of the Village Idiot Pub on Harrison Street in Coco, directly across from the big park. Visit Village Idiot Pub on Facebook for full event details. T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, all three engines up and burning, 2, 1, 0, and lift off. 5, 10, 3, 4! You're listening to the Twisted 10, bringing you original and unique post-created top 10 lists recorded live in world-famous Cocoa Beach, Florida, with hosts. Pack Van Sickle and Adam Hostin. All right, welcome to another episode of The Twisted Ten. I'm your host. Uh, actually, I'm not your host this week, but I'm one of the regular hosts on the show. My name is Adam. Uh, if you're a first time listener to The Twisted Ten, this is a unique and original top 10 list podcast. The hosts or guest hosts, in some cases, come up with their own ideas for uh, the top 10 list and bring it to the show for us to listen to, tear apart, commentate on, etc. So uh, again, my name's Adam. I'm not your host this week. Uh, sitting on the Lady Chase, of course. Hi, I'm Andrea Joy. Are you I the, am not your host this week. You're not the host week. this week either? No, right. not the stress of making a list this week. We're missing tack this, <laughs> <laughs> we're missing tack this week. So uh, he is uh, off doing SpaceX kind of stuff. And sitting on the other uh, chair in tax place this week. It is Jay Alvarez, and I am another just curious bystander this week, I guess. Oh, yeah. You know, when we started doing this type of podcast, we realized that the week of being it wasn't necessarily a good thing because it does require a ton of research, but (laughs) it's still fun to do. So I'd like to introduce our guest host for this week. Uh, This week, we have got Mr. Dan Cummins hosting The Twisted Ten. Uh, Thank you. Welcome, Dan. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for having me, man. I uh, I feel like all I do is research right now. It's, uh, <laughs> this was uh, yeah, I was researching for an episode for my my own podcast, Time Suck. I was H H Holmes, this uh, serial killer back in the uh, Chicago's World's Fair, and then I got a bonus episode about the Third Reich. So I've been researching Hitler, a lot of dark stuff. Wow, holy so <laughs> so it was actually <laughs> that's got to be an interesting Google search history now. <laughs> oh man, oh my yeah, my it, it's uh, when I'm at coffee shops doing my research. I almost just want to like, 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 like I have like books with swastikas on them, like Hitler <laughs> research, I have like serial killer stuff on my screen. It's like, I'm sure I make people, and I look creepy, so I'm sure I make people real nervous. So, <laughs> uh, so for our listeners, we, we've got Dan uh, on Skype with us. He's out in LA right now. We can actually see the sun behind him in the background a little bit. You know, actually I'm in Idaho. I was in LA. I'm living in, uh, I just moved to Coeur d'Alene. And so I am looking out, it looks sunny the way that it's set up behind me. Uh, in front of me, it's actually snowing. So I'm jealous of where you guys are. Wow. So hold on, because I've, I've actually driven through Coeur d'Alene. I had a, I had a oh, long yeah. and storied history as a truck driver for a little while. How are you loving it up there? Because I've always wanted to just <laughs> stop the truck and abandon it on the side of 90. 
You know, <laughs> Coeur, Coeur d'Alene is, I'm from Idaho originally, and Coeur like, I'm from a little kind of dumpy town in central Idaho. Uh, you know, I love it, but it's, it's no place I would want to live. It's like 400 people, middle of nowhere, and Coeur d'Alene was always looked at as like the, the, the hoity-toity, fancy town of Idaho, like the jewel yeah, it's it is beautiful. It's so nice. Like uh, I, I really, the people are super friendly. It's uh, it's pretty. It's it's laid back. I, I love it. Nice. But it's snowing. But it is snowing. That's it's too just, cold. <laughs> yeah, it's been a hard winter too this year. It, it, there's literally the snow has not left the ground since er, uh, early November. Oh my god. We drove it's to South bombarded. Carolina this last weekend to visit some relatives, and uh, that was cold enough for me. It was in the, the low 30s, and let me tell you, that chills me to the bone. I, I am not happy in that weather. Uh, you, would not, you would not be cut out for Coeur d'Alene then. That's, uh, I, I'm like, uh, low 30s in the winter? That's Wow, what a beautiful day. <laughs> <laughs> they were just yeah. commenting how warm it's been in uh, Chicago. They actually went through the first January and February without any snow on record. You know, I was just in Chicago at a club called Zany's like two weekends ago. And uh, all I needed was a hoodie for the whole week. It was crazy. I, I leave, you know, because sh- Chicago is usually pretty brutal in the winter. And uh, I, I think I want to say it reached 60 degrees one day. It was insane. Oh, wow. Oh, that's a party. Yeah, it was nice. And not even, and not even windy. Not even windy for once. 60 so great. is freezing. So for our listeners real quick, uh, yeah. Dan Cummins, if you haven't heard of him, he hosts a podcast called Time Suck. Uh, we'll put it in the show notes as well, but you can find it in Google. You can find it in uh, Google Play. You can find it in iTunes, Stitcher, all the typical places you're going to find a podcast. Same place you find this one, you'll find Time Suck. It is a fantastic podcast. I've binge listened to all, what, 24, 25 episodes that are out so far. Yeah, yeah thanks. He also does, Dan does uh, stand-up. Um, you might have seen him on shows like uh, the Jay Leno show or the Conan uh, O'Brien show. Yeah, or, yeah, late night stuff. Yeah, late night. That's a, a cool gig. Let me tell you, that was a fun internet black hole to get stuck in for a while, uh, looking up some of the stuff that you've done in the past. It was, it. was I've seen a few of them before, just you yeah. know, naturally watching what have you, but uh, before you come on the show, I like to research the guest and do stuff like that, and yeah, that was a fun black hole to get get stuck in. You oh, look a little I gotta different. put some new stuff in. I got some. I got a bunch of video from the new album that I got to put on because most of my stuff is so old. I had long hair and no beard. Exactly. Yeah, so yeah, people, Comedy Central special. <laughs> yeah, people will come to the show and like they won't realize it's me until like halfway through the show. They're like, oh, that, that really is him. <laughs> look like a di- look like a different person. Maybe if you did it upside down, so your beard would be your hair ah. and switch it. If I could just, if I could just tilt my head, <laughs> if I could just rip are. it around, yeah, that's me. <laughs> but you know, uh, this this last week or this week actually uh, uh, just came out today. The uh, my topic was uh, Billy the Kid. I love westerns. Nice. And so that's the list I made for you guys. And actually, after making this list, uh, it's a list of outlaws. I, I found some of them so fascinating. I kind of wish I would have went with uh, a few of these guys as opposed to Billy the Kid. I love Billy the Kid, but some of these other guys, I was like, oh, wow, man, I had no idea. I hadn't heard of some of these people, and some of the people I had heard of, and I thought all their stuff was Hollywood kind of nonsense. It, it turned out there was a lot of truth to the stories. It was just such a crazy era, like late 19th century Wild West. Cool. Yeah. And so, so my list, just to give you guys the twist, uh, it's, uh, it's 10 various Wild West outlaws, one of them is complete and utter nonsense. One of these people is not real. Mm. <laughs> nice. Awesome. He's I wonder if my relative twist. is in there. Oh, what? Who are you related to? Jesse James. Jesse James is, is, is the first one I'm going to bring up. No kidding. Oh, yeah. My family. I call that one fake. <laughs> that's the one that's fake. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. There was no <laughs> Jesse James. So let's, well, let's get into Jesse James then. So let's, uh, he, he's, he's number 10. Number 10. 10. Yes. <laughs> Number 10, so I'm going to give a various amount of info, some of these people more info than others, uh, but, let's, but Jesse James, he was a bank uh, and train robber in the American uh, Wild West, uh, known for leading uh, the members of the James Younger Gang of Outlaws. He was born in September 5th, uh, 1847 in Kearney, Missouri, and he and his brother Frank served for the Confederate Army before uh, embarking on their criminal careers, and they made a name for themselves as kind of like the premier, I guess, uh, bank robbers uh, of their day and train robbers. And there's, there's kind of like this mythology that they were like Robin Hood, where they would like steal and then give to the poor. Uh, turns out that's, that's nonsense. Uh, they, <laughs> <laughs> they did the stealing part. Uh, the stealing part is totally true. But then when it came to giving to the poor, they're like, ah, let's, let's skip that part of the Robin Hood mythology and, <laughs> nice. and just keep the money. So uh, from 1860 all the way to 1882, they had an especially long career. Uh, they were the most feared kind of outlaws as far as robbers in American history, responsible for more than 20 bank and train robberies, 
the murders of countless individuals, stole an estimated 200 grand, which would be well over uh, 2 million in today's dollars. But it, that doesn't really translate that well, though, because even though it'd only be over 2 million in today's dollars, you could do a lot more with $200,000 in the late 19th century than you could with 2 million today. Yeah. Right. Like it, it was a tremendous amount of money as far as what goods you could buy and land and all that well, kind of like stuff. Well, that's like in the th- A Million Ways to Die in the West. If you ever seen that, they say, yeah. you know, when one guy holds up an actual dollar bill, that's a right. dollar right there. You know, oh, yeah. It's unheard of oh, to yeah. see those things. Yeah. Money went a long, long ways. I mean, like you could buy land for like 20 bucks, you know, that kind of stuff. And uh, in 1879, the James brothers, they had planned uh, one more robbery. Uh, with Charlie and Robert Ford, two of the members. Uh, little did they know that the governor of Missouri had put together a reward so large, $25,000 on your uh, relative, Andrea, his head. <laughs> a 20, that's a ton of money, $25,000. Uh, $25, we so ain't after, cheap. <laughs> yeah, after breakfast on April 3rd, 1882, Jesse turned to straighten a picture on the wall of his home. And uh, Bob, one of his longtime gang members, uh, Bob Ford shot him in the back of the head. Oh, So he was... Dead instantly at the age of 34 years old. By his own crew. By his own crew. Oh, yeah. his own Nowadays, crew. you just have to worry about someone turning snitch back then. Nah, bullet to the head. Bullet to the head, man. Bullet to... Man, people just got... That's what, what I've learned doing this list. People got shot all of the time back then. <laughs> like, there was just so much shooting uh, in, in, the, in the Wild West. <laughs> now, was, there, was it for a reward? What did he, what did he shoot him for? Yeah, $25,000 yeah. for, for reward. the reward. Yep, 25 grand. I mean, and, and you know, and, and, and you think about that, over 22 years of robberies, they made a total of $200,000. So 25 grand in one bullet was a tremendous amount of money, you know, for these guys. Yeah, good point. Yeah. That's exactly yeah, so. what the FBI or whoever, whoever the hell the, the you know, county uh, uh, sheriffs or whoever put the bounty up for it was hoping. Yeah. That's exactly yeah, what they were hoping yeah. for. Yeah. So wait, gotta, but wouldn't he have had a warrant too if he was also part of the gang? Like, did he report that and get the reward and then get arrested? <laughs> you know what's funny is, I like, it didn't say specifically on that, but it's like, it was an interesting time where it's, it, I feel like it's kind of comparable to like a lower level gang member today. It's like, if you rat out the guy at the top right you get you get amnesty and you know like you don't serve time so i think it was a deal where it's like you you get him Uh and yeah we'll give you the reward and we'll forget about what you did we we want the head of the snake dead so he copped a plea that included murder (laughs) yeah yeah basically which is a worse crime than bank robbery (laughs) right if they were on the spree for 22 years and he was 34 he was 12 when he started oh you know what you know what? That's a that's a very good point. Like uh, he couldn't have been the initial uh, leader, so I think the younger gang started, and then he joined in and became the James Younger Gang. Because absolutely, yeah, that would be. But you know what's weird? A lot of these guys, like Jesse, uh, Billy the Kid, we're going to listen to later, did start when they were like 14, 15 years old. They well, I guess up- girls were getting married when they were you know twelve yeah. back then. Well, so. twelve you're, you're an adult. Well, I remember like doing a thing on uh, Houdini later, and Houdini like left home to provide. Uh, to like go get work and send money home to his family when he was 12. So it's like these guys, it was a very, children were not protected the same way they are now. Yeah, different <laughs> different time. Too bad. Yeah, I love the Houdini yeah. episode. That was a great time suck episode, by the way. Yeah, it was a, a learning experience where I remember thinking about my son. My son's 11, and he couldn't survive 90 minutes on his own in the real world. <laughs> my, my son is also 11. And my if he daughter had it, is 11. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, I can't trust my son with boiling an egg. Like, <laughs> yeah, right? Isn't that crazy? <laughs> And back then, you would be – these kids – I remember like uh, going back to the Houdini. So maybe he actually was uh, 12 when he started because Houdini had a full-time job when he was eight years old. <laughs> so, oh my gosh. Like, like there were no child labor laws back then. <laughs> They're just like, yeah, you want to shine some shoes all day? Go for it. <laughs> yeah, eight years old, your pappy hanging you down the shotgun. You're the man of the house now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. My, my grandpa, uh, he, he lived, uh, grew up on a farm. He said when he was four, he had um, uh, early morning chores. He was literally ha- helping milk the cows when he was four years old. <laughs> At four, I was going into my mom's bed because it was cold outside and my toesies were freezing <laughs> and I had a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. What a man. What a, that's, that's why when people talk, yeah, I mean, yeah, I've never, never thought it was a good idea to go back in the past. It just seems super shitty back then. <laughs> Uh, so, okay. So next outlaw is number nine is a guy. I had never heard of this guy. Uh, Rufus Buck. What a name, Rufus. No kidding. Uh, born in 1873, dead before the age of 25. He was a leader of the, uh, Rufus Buck gang. So he got his name on his gang. Uh, it, it was a multiracial gang, which I didn't even realize was a thing back in the wild west. <laughs> uh, the members were, uh, African-American and Creek Indian. 
And they robbed, raped, and killed in the Indian Territory of the Arkansas, Oklahoma area from 1895 to 1896. And here's a list of uh, some crimes committed by the Rufus Buck Gang. In, in 1895, they killed a U.S. Deputy Marshal, John Garrett. Uh, also uh, came across a white man and his daughter in a wagon. The man was held at gunpoint. The girl was taken by the gang. They ended up kind of taking a small harem of women as they went about their uh, crimes. Uh, they robbed a bunch of country stores and uh, Oklahoma and murdered two white women and a 14-year-old girl in August of 1895. Also in August 1895, uh, supposedly uh, raped a Mrs. Hassan near Sepulpa, Oklahoma, and then her and two uh, uh, of three other female victims of the gang, a Miss Aries and an Indian girl named Sepulpa, were also killed. A fourth victim, Mrs. Wilson, was reported to have recovered, and they were like supposedly raped. They're raped straight and old bastards. They're just out there killing all sorts of people. At least Jesse yeah, they James were... was just robbing people. <laughs> He yeah, these guys were too. these. Yeah, these were the more, more of the rape and pillage variety. Apparently, the Rufus Buck gang, and they uh, they were captured in August eighth on August August eighth, eighteen ninety five, by an Indian white posse, uh, charged with rape, sentenced to death. But the cases appealed all the way to the Supreme Court, which was unusual for kind of outlaws. Usually, they just hung them real fast. And then on July first, eighteen ninety six, the entire gang was hung in unison. They wow. <laughs> just hung them all, <laughs> big old gallows, and then just all the ropes uh, dropped. And they were the only people to be hung in that area for rape. They were ever, never actually charged with murder. They just uh, hung them for the rape charge. Oh, man. So that was that was Rufus Buck uh, and his gang. And uh, yeah, I, 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 until reading that, I, I, I just, all the ones I'd heard about as far as outlaws were always like the Jesse James or the Billy Kid. They're always white dudes, so I didn't yeah, realize it they never were. never occurred to me that, it, especially that a man named Rufus, my immediately thought, my immediate thought was, oh, white guy named Rufus, how weird. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, oh, yeah, no, black yeah, dude. Yeah, yep. uh, yeah, yeah my, my immediate thought like... for that was I'm related to Rufus, uh, just because of the name. I've got a Rufus in my family. <laughs> Do you really? Like, how far back? Uh, uncle, so on my distant uncle. You have an uncle Rufus? Yes, and I have an uncle Theron. Yeah, I've got some. I've got some bizarre names. Well, Theron, Theron sounds good. Rufus, I just yeah, I'm kind of I think where Jay's going. Like Rufus, I picture like a guy with like a corn cob pipe and a straw hat. Oh, you know my relatives. Like, <laughs> like he does, he he doesn't own shoes. He's always barefoot. Rufus. <laughs> that definitely sounds like my family. Those are saying. my. That's all my family in Oklahoma. Yeah, the, the Andrea's from Oklahoma, so yeah. <laughs> oh, really? You got some uh, some Okies? Oh yes, born and raised. Okay, okay, so yeah, so some Rufuses out there. This next guy has a better name. Number eight. Uh, finally has a nickname. I feel like a lot of these guys had cool nicknames. Um, Cherokee Bill. Cherokee Bill Goldsby, which is not a last name I would expect with the first part being Cherokee Bill. <laughs> Cherokee Cher- Bill, and he's Jewish. Oddly enough, he was Navajo, as you'll find out. <laughs> how, does, um, <laughs> how does that work? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Born in 18, 1876, dead at 20 in 1896. Uh, Cherokee Bill killed eight men, including his brother-in-law, um, and he was another, uh, he was mulatto father and then Cherokee, uh, white and black mother. And, uh, in the spring of 1894, at the age of 18, Cherokee Bill's crime spree began when he shot a man named Jake Lewis for beating up his younger brother. So maybe, you know, maybe it started with, you know, protecting the fam. And then, uh, uh, I guess the guy would later recover from the wounds. Uh, he was, he thought he killed this guy. So he took off, fled for the Creek and Seminole nations, joined up with some outlaws, which was kind of common for these guys back then, uh, Jim and Bill Cook. And afterwards, uh, Bill Cook and Cherokee Bill rounded up a gang and began to terrorize Oklahoma. <laughs> uh, started out small, first accused of like stealing some whiskey, horse theft. Uh, then they advanced to robbing banks, stores, and stagecoaches. And just kind of ruthless, I guess, just uh, kind of known for shooting just anyone who got in their way. On July 16th, the gang reportedly uh, robbed a man named William Drew. Two days later, held up the Frisco train at Red Fork. Uh, however, uh, due to the express ma- messenger having had the foresight to hide the money behind some boxes, they, they didn't really take much money. Uh, it's kind of a theme with them. They never really got much money, but they, they robbed a lot of places for very little money. They stole 500 bucks from the Lincoln County Bank in Chandler, Oklahoma, killed one person, wounded others. Uh, one of their gang members was shot and killed in that process. Uh, there was a Wild West shootout uh, in Oklahoma on Sepulpa. Sepulpa keeps coming up. <laughs> is, is that still a place, Sepulpa? Have you heard of that? Uh-huh. Oh, okay. I, it sounded like a fake town to me. Yeah, it does. Until it, until it came up in a, a fake second person. one. <laughs> Ooh, maybe one of these is fake. Well, in Sepulpa, uh, Oklahoma, they had a shootout, and uh, uh, one uh, a, they killed a lawman in that time. So now they're in, in some some real trouble. And that was a uh, that was a thing too. I feel like in the Wild West, if you killed like random townsfolk, they'd be like, Ah, come on, man! Like, you know, ease <laughs> yeah. up. Yeah, exactly. Well, Don't do that. 
But when you killed a deputy or a sheriff, then they're like, all ah, right, now we got to track you down. We got to get the Pinkertons or the Marshalls or something on you. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, they uh, they robbed the J.A. Parkinson and Company store in uh, Okmulgee. Is that a still a town? Okmulgee. Okay, yep, Okmulgee, Oklahoma. Yep. Mm-hmm. On September 1st, they got $600 there. That was big for them. Uh, then they robbed the depot of the Missouri Pacific Railroad in Claremore, Oklahoma, less than two hours later. Uh, robbed a railroad agent in Chateau. Nine days later, they wrecked the Kansas City and Pacific Express five miles south of Wagoner, Oklahoma, making off of some loot there. And just kind of just kept going like little spots here, little spots there. Um, finally got caught in on January, or on April 13th, sorry, April 13th, uh, 1895, and quickly sentenced to death is Cherokee Bill. And I guess he was just kind of casual about it. He didn't care, didn't seem concerned that he was sentenced to death. And, it, and it, we uh, find out that it was because someone had snuck him a gun. Which I'm amazed how often that comes Whoa. up. All these guys were constantly having like guns snuck to them in jails and prison. Like pr- like prison was was so different back then. Or like usually it was like a courthouse. Well, wait a minute. Is it, is it really different? How different is it? You can get stuff well, snuck no, in jail I, apparently I'm, now. But, really but it's not a gun. Yeah, I don't yeah. imagine yeah. it being like like something out of Ducktales. You get like a gun or a nail file brought in through a cake. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> He, he gets a gun uh, uh, smuggled to him by a trustee on July 26, 1895. He, ch- he attempts jailbreak. A gun battle breaks out between him and the prison guards. He kills one of the prison guards. Uh, the shoot off, uh, or shootout results in a standoff when the guards are unable to disarm Cherokee Bill. But then another inmate, uh, this guy Henry Starr, who was another outlaw, he volunteers to kind of help disarm Cherokee Bill if they'll kind of go lenient on him going forward, and it works. He actually does disarm uh, Cherokee Bill, and Teddy Roosevelt actually like kind of semi pardons him, lets him out early, and then he'll go on to rob more people later. So that that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that and uh, in the meantime, uh, Cherokee Bill's lawyer now is working on an appeal. Somehow he isn't quickly hung, even though he killed a prison guard, and um, maintaining that Bill had not received a fair t- trial initially. Uh, by Judge Isaac Parker, who had characterized Cherokee Bill as a bloodthirsty mad dog who killed for the love of killing and as the most vicious of all outlaws in Oklahoma Territory. That's a hell of a title. <sighs> it is. And, and he seems like a, a, a badass, this guy, like a crazy dude, because when he doesn't, his appeal doesn't work, he's sentenced to die. And then reportedly, when he's asked if he had any last words, <laughs> he says, quote, I came here to die, not to make a speech. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fucking man's man right there. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. If Nick yeah. Offerman was ever sentenced to death, I'd like to think that those were his last words. <laughs> <laughs> I came here to die, not to make a speech. Oh, my God. Yeah. And then and, and then there was some other thing, I guess, when he was like, uh, so he says that he's getting ready. And then when he's at the, um, has the rope on his neck, his actual... Um, like very last words are this is as good a day to die as any and then wow dead he goes so yeah and that's kind of a common thing i notice with these outlaws too i don't know if it's just um i mean a lot of it comes from newspaper reports so from eyewitnesses so i don't know why they would make it up but man these guys were just like hard to the very end like i feel like i would be just whimpering and crying for mercy <laughs> yeah absolutely well, there's also a lot of lead in the water back then the head you know <laughs> mine isn't exactly in the right place <laughs> Well, yeah, I want to think of them as like criminal masterminds, but maybe they were just, yeah, like you said, just kind of dull people who are just like, yeah, why not? Uh, it's, I might as well be dead. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Opium was legal. You know, those That's types true. of things. Wouldn't that be weird if like the best bank robbers of all time were just people who got talked into it? Like, hey, you want to rob a bank? Well, yeah, yeah. And that's it. It's right, right. It was just that simple. <laughs> well, I, you know, a, a lot of these guys, it's like, you know, um, I think different than today, maybe a little bit is just extreme poverty and the hardness of life back then. Like people died so often and jobs were so horrible that uh, I, th- I feel like there was a-, a fair amount of people who stole cattle and stole this and stole that and ended up falling into these gangs because it was kind of like 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 there were orphans were super common. Like I noticed a lot of these outlaws, their parents are dead by the time they're 13, they're on their own. And it's kind of that or, you know, die themselves. You brought that up in that uh, in the internet scam episode on uh, on Time Suck, oh, where like, yeah, people out yeah. in Lagos are just it's it's not they're pulling scams not necessarily because they're horrible horrible people they are right. but it's kind of the right, situation no. they're in also. 
Oh, yeah, you're right. Like yeah, those Nigerian email scammers, it's like it's easy to say like, ah, oh, these pieces of shit, like why are they doing this? But it's like we're saying that from our comfortable, you know, first world lives over in America. As yeah. we're Skyping, yeah. yes. <laughs> you, yeah, yeah, so we're Skyping. You presented, we're Skyping. Such an, you presented such an interesting twist on the Nigerian scam, the, 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 entire, in, the entire market of those people that yeah. I had never really considered is the perspective of we're so impoverished that if we're able to scam some, you know, fat American out of, you know, a hundred dollars here and there or or whatever, it's, you know, it's a pain in the ass for him, but it's a livelihood for us. That's how we feed our children. You presented such an interesting twist in that episode. That was fascinating because I had never considered the opposite side of that spectrum and and thought, yeah, you know, it's accept it's tolerated over there. Well, not necessarily tolerated, but it's not chased because they have so many other problems in that country. Oh, it's such a hellhole over there. They got Boko Haram and all these people raping and murdering. And like the average person lives in, I like the, um, what was the term they had? It was not extreme poverty. Absolute. Oh, absolute. Absolute. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, like what a horrible term if you're living in quote absolute poverty. <laughs> like you can't be more impoverished. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> ah. Okay, number seven. I love this guy's nickname. Number seven is Blackjack Ketchum. <laughs> like Blackjack. That's a good that's a good outlaw nickname. That's a cool name, yeah. I agree. Yeah. That's a man with and a deck he, of cards on him. <laughs> exactly, exactly. He's, he knows a couple tricks. He can do a little close up magic. He was born on Halloween, uh, 1863, in San Saba County, Texas. And um, he was part of a, a, an outlaw gang. And uh, they were train robbers and stagecoach robbers. Uh, at one point in 1892, he held up a train on the Santa Fe Railroad and got $20,000. So, you know, it was a pretty successful kind of bank and train robber. On December 12th, 1895, um, uh, Black Jack and several other men killed John N. Jap Powers. These nicknames on these guys, that sounds fairly racist. Uh, a little bit. <laughs> uh, but that's the nickname, Jap Powers. And uh, <laughs> so then they're, now they've killed somebody. So now they're hightailing out of Texas. And they head off to New Mexico. And then in New Mexico, the, uh, the Ketchum gang, they, I guess they were well known. Like back then, there was kind of like a prestige to some of these gang members where it's like, uh, like the appeal of an outlaw. But they would take their the money they made robbing stagecoaches and trains. They buy themselves some fancy clothes. They would show up in town and be buying drinks at the saloon for lots of women and dressed up and were kind of like little minor celebrities in New Mexico. Hmm. And uh, yeah, the the in, in September third, eighteen ninety seven, uh, Black Jack, Jack and his gang uh, rob another train, making another twenty thousand dollars in gold and forty thousand dollars in silver. So again, pretty successful. Yeah. Yeah. The big, big time money. That's lots of money to throw around to the ladies of uh, New Mexico. <laughs> uh, July 11th, 1899, the gang strikes again. After camping at the head of the Dry Canyon in northeast New Mexico, Sam Ketchum, Bill Carver, Elza Lay, and an outlaw named McGinnis made off with 50000 from a train in Folsom, New Mexico. So these guys, they're, they're very good at this. They really knew their targets compared to the $500 here and there from, you know, yeah. number eight. It was, they're, they're hitting, hitting high dollar targets in this one. Well, they had, and I guess they were very well armed was part of their thing. They had high power rifles. Uh, they had smokeless powder for kind of uh, uh, setting off some kind of explosions and things. So that was part of their, uh, why they were so good is they were kind of like uh, Chicago gangsters in the uh, 20s and 30s. They just were better armed than the actual police trying to stop them. And uh, in, in, in one of their battles, Sam Ketchum and McGinnis are wounded. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the posse uh, who was trying to catch him, they fare even worse. Uh, a sheriff and, and another uh, deputy, uh, they're killed. And um, so now Sam and McGinnis are taken into custody where Sam has developed gangrene from his wound. Uh, McGinnis later uh, recovered a certain time in the Santa Fe Penitentiary on August 16th. Elza Lay was arrested, later tried and convicted for the murder of Ed Farr, sentenced to life in prison. So a lot of the, they, they you know, these, these things never last for long. That's another thing I noticed. O- outside of Jesse James, very few of these uh, runs lasted more than maybe like two years. Yeah, that's a good point. So, of course, their lifespans didn't really last very long back then either in general. Oh, yeah. If you weren't a criminal. Most of, these, most of these guys were dead by 25. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Blackjack, so his brother is caught. All these other guys are caught. Um, he tries to make a final solitary, solitary attempt at train robbery in August 6, 1899. <laughs> this does not work out well for him. Uh-oh. Uh, he boards a train from the blind side of the baggage car. He planned to force the train to stop, but the conductor uh, has a shotgun, is ready for him, and basically blows his arm almost completely off. <laughs> oh. Yeah, but he, does, he doesn't die, and he actually escapes. He, like, jumps off of the train, and now he's, like, down to one arm, but somehow doesn't bleed to death, 
and basically just like lays there uh, by he can't get on his horse and is just stuck on the side of this these railroad tracks for two days. Um, he later reports, I tried a dozen times to mount my horse, but I was too weak to do it. Weary and dizzy from the pain. Uh, he tries to wait for some more of his posse to show up, but they don't. And then uh, finally, another train comes by, and uh, he draws a gun on them. And the conductor said, quote, we just came to help you, but if this is the way you feel, we'll just go ahead and leave you. <laughs> and, at that- <laughs> and at that point, this poor one-armed uh, blackjack just basically begs them to take him to uh, you know nearby town so he doesn't die. And so he is taken. He's taken to Trinidad, Colorado, placed in this hospital. His arm is uh, amputated. What's left? It's kind of like dangling. I guess it's pretty gory. Uh, he pleads innocent, but the judge finds him guilty, sentences him to ha- uh, death by hanging. And <laughs> this is like the most horrific, horrific hanging I read about. Uh, he was scheduled on April 26, 1901 to be hung. Uh, and I guess it was like a big attraction. This is so morbid. But a lot of times these outlaw hangings, it would be like uh, – a big deal in the town and people would gather kind of like, like kind of like for a concert. Yeah. Like a fair day or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Right. You'd have like the entire town, like, you know, women and kids and everything, you know, out having snacks, like getting ready for, you know, whoever to be hung. And, and they, they got a fucking show this day. They got a serious show. Um, so the town of Clayton, um, they have no experience hanging a man and there was debate concerning the length of the rope oh, no. <laughs> so the night before they do a dry run and uh, the rope was tested by attaching a 200 pound sandbag to the noose dropping it through the trap uh finally at 1 30 p.m blackjack ketchum is taken to the scaffold they're adjusting his hood and i guess ketchum says again one of these badasses he says quote hurry up boys let's get this over with <laughs> nice <laughs> Uh, yeah, because he's got things to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Finally, Sheriff Garcia, he takes, it takes him two blows with a hatchet to cut the rope. Tom falls through the trap. Um, but unfortunately, the, the inexperienced hangman had forgotten about the sandbag they used to test the rope. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the sandbag's still there. So he's tiptoeing on top of the sandbag? Well, the sandbag, the way, like, he doesn't quite, his feet don't quite hit the ground, but the force of him falling by the sudden stop essentially rips his head off oh my oh. god yeah and all this. right <laughs> so it says when blackjack fell through the drop he was immediately decapitated uh the black hood pinned to his shirt was the only thing that kept his head from rolling around on the ground <laughs> uh a few minutes later the doctor still goes through the formality of pronouncing him dead i feel like that's a little bit of overkill at that point <laughs> And then prior to burial, they sewed his head back on so he could have, I guess, what they considered a proper burial. <laughs> Boys, this is going to be an open <laughs> casket. Yeah, but man, what a show for those people. It's like, oh my God, that's so gruesome. Like watching a hanging, but then the hanging just literally like rips the guy's head off. But then the cloth of the, the little black thing you're wearing causes the head to kind of basically flop down on the body. <laughs> well, that's why you go to hangings. It's like going to, it's like going to NASCAR yeah. events. You go because you're hoping you see the train wreck. <laughs> that's true. That's true. There, I'm sure they were like, that was the best hanging we'll ever see in our lives. There are so many of our um, NASCAR dads that are uh, our listeners that are now yelling at Jay for that comment. I got into an argument one time about that. Oh, yeah. We can, tangent on, yesterday, <laughs> one we, can NASCAR, we can tangent on NASCAR all day long about you don't go to NASCAR for the wrecks. Well, that's like a touchdown in a football game. That's what you're there. That's what everybody stands up for and cheer. But the purists, the purists claim that's not true, though, right? They claim it's like you watch it for the, yeah, this, uh, yeah, the skill. Yeah, yeah. I don't get it either. I've never. I mean, I understand people like it, but I'm just like, I've tried watching it, and I'm like, ah, they're just going around. They just keep going around, going around and around. Exactly. Just look out yeah. the window on a road trip. Cars everywhere, driving. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind. Of, it's kind of like soccer. I, I I try to get into soccer, but I'm just like uh, maybe if the score was like thirty to forty, I'd be into it. But I'm like I'm not gonna watch for an hour and then it's like one goal. Yeah, make the make it's the not, field I don't get like it. a tenth the size, and then uh, yeah, that might make it a little bit more interesting. Yeah, it's a tough time. <laughs> it's a hard life being a soccer fan. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> okay, number six. Uh, we're gonna end the first half on on a on a big bang here. This guy was maybe the the most. Uh, prolific as far as killing uh, outlaw I read about and his, and his nickname uh, he lives up to it it's James Killer Miller yep okay I, nice you've heard of this guy nope <laughs> oh yeah but you just say yeah, exactly James Killer Miller uh, this guy is unbelievable um, maybe the darkest and most sadistic figure I read about from the old west he was a, a paid assassin and a gunslinger excuse me uh, known to have killed at least 14 people though legend has it the number was closer to 50 he was uh, more into killing than he was into robbing 
Hmm. Uh, he was also known as Deacon Jim because he regularly went to church and never smoked or drank. He was just a purist. He just killed. He's got to be a good Christian man about it. <laughs> I know. It's so, isn't that such a weird, this guy's terrifying to me. Just the guy who goes to church on Sunday. But then also he said, uh, according to what I read, it was his rate was anywhere from 150 bucks to 2000 bucks per kill. And you pay his rate, no questions asked. He's going to go kill who you want killed. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah, and he had he had the last uh, his last words. Just kind of skip ahead before I get into what he did. When he was finally a lynch mob finally got him in an Oklahoma jail because uh, he was tried a few times, but he kept you know getting away with his crimes. And they were like, "We're not having it anymore." A lynch mob takes him from the authorities, uh, takes him to a barn where they hang him. And right before they hung him, his last words were, "Let her rip." <laughs> <laughs> I love these guys. I love these guys. Just so bad. So uh, he was born on uh, October 25th, 1861, Van Buren, Arkansas. And uh, some, he, he's, all these myths get thrown around with these guys. And this one I found no actual, it didn't seem that accurate. But it's, there's a legend that when he was eight, uh, he killed his own grandparents. But I think that's just because he became such a brutal killer later. They started throwing more stuff on his mythology. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But uh, by 1880, he was documented as living with his widowed mom and siblings in Coriel County. Four years later, his sister, Georgia, marries a man named John Coop. And I guess uh, Killer Miller uh, did not like this man. And on July 30th, 1884, John Coop was killed by a shotgun blast to the face uh, while he was in bed at his home. And uh, it was, and, and no, there was no witnesses uh, to this, but everybody assumes that Jim did it. And then he, he fled uh, to get away from this. And then, so afterwards, uh, Miller hooks up with an outlaw gang in San Saba County, Texas, robbing trains and stagecoaches. He did get into that for a little while, uh, often killing in the process. And then he purchased a saloon in San Saba. And it was at that time he embarked on his crew's assassin, casually proclaiming again that he would just kill anybody for 150 to 2,000 bucks. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what determined that rate. <laughs> like it's a big window. Like I don't know if it was like it never says there. Like I don't know if it was like if it was like a little man who wasn't good with a gun. He's like, yeah, 150. That'll be an easy one. <laughs> But if it was some guy with a reputation, maybe he had to jack it up to two grand. Man, so this is a business uh, owner. He's got he owns a saloon. So I wonder if it's yeah. the stereotypical. Hey, you go in there and ask for you know this guy killer Miller, whatever, and uh, he's in the back somewhere. So you go up to the you know the the the, yeah. the bar to order a drink, and you order a very specific drink, and that's the cue to bring oh, him back to I the like back that. room. You know what I mean? That's. Hope yeah. that, I hope this guy's not I the made up no, one. I'm just, fascinated with this story. I would just <laughs> love to see him in that back bar room and just be like, "Yep, that'll cost you two hundred. <laughs> Right, right, 2000 exactly. if you want me to get fancy with it. <laughs> and, and, he, and he sounds like, he reminds me of like a Wild West, like Christian Bale in American Psycho. Just a very, he was known for being very well-dressed, very meticulous, and very just calm about, you know, killing people. He seemed, I mean, he, like a true sociopath. Yep, absolutely. Um, and, he, and he wasn't like a quick draw. Uh, his, he wasn't, uh, you know, the guy with a six-shooter on his hip. His style was just to ambush people uh, and just dispatch of them with a shotgun. So he was just like, that's the way that works best. Uh, didn't care about shooting people in the back. It just, however, you know, what, what's the best way to get rid of that person? Assassinations are, uh, you don't really hear real stories about assassinations too much anymore, but right, North Korea, uh, uh, did you hear about the, the, the two... Uh, yep. Girls yep. in North the Korea. two women who they they snuck up and wiped that stuff on his face and it was some kind of poison. Oh, yeah, it was uh, um Kim oh, Jong it? whatever yeah, Kim Jong Un's brother. Jong-un. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Kim Jong something or another. Uh, I can't he was de- he was dead in like twenty minutes. I want to say right because the the, uh, nerve the, agent. The, the the dosage was so so high or whatever the DX or something. It was a fascinating remember. story. So the two of them uh, uh, to make this real short, the first girl comes up yeah. and spritzes him with just regular water. And, you know, he was freaking out because he thought that was the assassination attempt on him. But then this other passerby, Good Samaritan, has a rag yeah, to yeah. come up and help wipe it off. That's when the agent actually no was applied. Way. It was fascinating. Yeah. And they, they talked about it. And then apparently the, the second one, which was the second assassin, uh, immediately yeah. went to wash it off because one drop of this nerve agent will kill a human in, you know, no time oh at all. My God. And she was wiping it all over his face to try to help clean him up. And that was actually when the, the nerve agent was administered. So, yeah, that was a really cool story to hear. I mean, it's horrible because somebody died, but it was a really cool story to hear how they did that. It's terrifying to know that that stuff exists, that somebody could wipe something on your face and you could be dead in like 20 minutes. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I, did, I didn't know that was a thing. 
Yeah, um, no. I think most people call it Taco Bell ground beef. <laughs> <laughs> if you, yeah, that's the your your body has adapted to process it through your intestine, but if you actually get it on your skin, yeah, yeah. it'll absorb through your pores and kill you in twenty minutes. <laughs> yeah, it's all that pink that pink stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that that uh, oh my god, I read a horrible thing years ago. Uh, supposedly, Taco Bell meat is like there's di- there's different levels of meat. Supposedly, Taco Bell meat is like the scrapings off the slaughter room floor. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. No, no. What was it? Uh, like dog food is typically like grade C beef, and then the meat you get at most fast food joints is uh, rated D. Oh, exactly. Oh, God, you know what though? So it tastes bad. good with some fire sauce and some nachos. <laughs> I'm just saying, give me some more of it. We just had Taco Bell a few days ago. Well, Killer Miller wasn't eating that crappy meat. He was living on that assassin money, having <laughs> steaks. Yeah, yes. no kidding. And he eventually settled in Pecos, Texas, where he was hired uh, by Reeves County Sheriff George A. Bud Frazier as a deputy. That was a weird thing. It happened a lot of times back then. These guys would be outlaws one year, a deputy the next, go back to being outlaw. It was, you got to uh, go where the money is, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, the, the interview process was real lax. I feel like back then they didn't do. Uh, <laughs> you ever kill anybody? Checks. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. Sounds good to me. You're sheriff now. Yeah, it turns up all my references are no, no longer here with us. <laughs> well, well uh, at the time he he hired this guy Killer Miller to be uh, a deputy because cattle rustling and horse uh, theft had really increased in the Pecos Valley. And, uh, and I guess this Miller, you know, spent a lot of his time pursuing these thieves, but uh, when he never captured any, it raised suspicions in the mind of local gunfighter and hard case Barney Riggs, who just happened to be the sheriff's brother-in-law. And uh, as the increase in thefts had started to occur, just about the same time Miller became deputy, Riggs pointed out that perhaps Miller should be looked as a suspect and suggested he should be fired. Uh, Frazier confronted the deputy Miller. He laughed off the accusation. And, uh, but this kind of started a, a rift between Frazier and Miller. And ended up becoming a feud. He ended up eventually being fired. And this feud lasts several years. And this is such a crazy story. I can't believe I've never heard this before. Uh, They get in numerous gunfights. This guy, uh, Sheriff Frazier and Miller. They get in three gunfights. And over the next few years. And the first gunfight, uh, Miller is gunned down in the middle of the street. And then, uh, uh, you know, assumes that he is dead. The the sheriff does. And, uh, you know, leaves him there. Some people drag him off. He had a chest plate. Uh, like a metal chest plate underneath his trench coat. Yeah, like like old-fashioned armor. And supposedly, like, he always wore this, like, trench coat, no matter how hot it was. And then they're like, oh, well, that's why. Hmm. Well, so, I, I don't know how, but word never gets back to Sheriff Frazier that he had the chest plate. He gets drug away. He goes and recovers uh, from his kind of superficial wounds in his limbs. And then Frazier finds out he's alive. They tracks him down again. They have a second gun battle. You'd think this guy would maybe try and shoot him in the head this time. Uh, shoots him down in the street again. Again, the chest plate saves him. <laughs> no kidding. And and this was not good for Sheriff Frazier because then the third time they fight, uh, Miller uh, shoots Frazier in the face, and so uh, he he wins the only the only battle that counts. Yeah, yeah. No kidding. And and again, you would think you would think that if you sh- shot a guy twice. And he's still like out there hanging around. You would make it like a huge priority in life in life to find that guy and put a bullet in his head. And that's his former boss that was trying to shoot him. Yep, See, I, yep. I feel like Miller's coming back and finally getting his red st- his red stapler back, and then shooting <laughs> him in the face on the way he's, out he's, and burning the building stapler. down. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. He finally did it. He finally did it. And he and he never was convicted for anything. He finally was like you know caught. What and, do you? And he, what charge do you press? Hey, this guy tried to kill me twice. He tried a third time right. and I shot him in the face. <laughs> Am I really gonna face some charges here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he, and that was when the posse got him. So like on his final trial. Like the the local people, they knew were like they're like this guy is a assassin. This guy just killed you know like the sheriff. It's like we're not waiting for him to slip out on a technicality. And that's when they a posse actually like takes him from the courthouse, takes him to the barn, and that's when he's hung with his final words of let her rip. So in this lawless society, can you imagine being on the jury of the yeah. people tried to convict it? Uh, uh, not guilty. Uh, my name is Adam. He's not guilty. Remember me, all right? Not yeah. guilty. <laughs> you don't want to. Well, you don't want to find him guilty if you're on that jury. Oh yeah. I mean, these guys escaped all the time. Uh, like uh, it's it's crazy. Like like Billy the Kid. Well, we'll read about him a little bit later. He's coming up. He escaped numerous times from from jail. You know, it's like. But you're exactly right. If I'm just some ranch hand, exactly. and I'm on a jury. I am covering my ass. I'm like, nah, it looks, looks innocent to me. You know, they could have like 17 eyewitnesses. We were all there when he blasted this guy in the head. I don't know. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. <laughs> Where's the proof? 
<laughs> yeah, he seems like a nice guy. He seems like a very nice guy. I'd buy him a drink. You got pictures? You got sketches? <laughs> Any drawings? Right, nope. Right, no. right. <laughs> exactly. And that's and that's the first five. So that is ten through six. Oh, all right. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, the first that those those first five were fantastic. This is a, such a cool topic. Um, my father is a huge Western fan, so I cannot wait for him to listen. Uh, to this to this episode, he listens to about half of our podcasts. You know, he's not a big oh, cool. podcast guy, but uh, I know he's going to like uh, like some of the Western stories. It's a fascinating per- period of history. It's like uh, I didn't know again how much was kind of like glamorized by Hollywood, but it seems like some of those westerns it was fairly accurate. Like there really was just a lot of killing. Like, like people just got shot and robbed constantly. Yeah. Complete lawless society. Our um, Oklahoma yeah. history classes in high school were very interesting. <laughs> oh, I bet. A lot I of bet. the state histories aren't as fun. Ours was really fun because there's so much crazy stuff that happened back then. Well, yeah, because they, they didn't have when these places were territories. They didn't. They might have like one marshal or one sheriff, and it was, it's not like it's some guy who went to police academy. It was just like it was like, do you want to try and clean this up? And some guy would be like, I, I guess. And then like you know, and then he's the sheriff, but he might be like the only law person for thousands of square miles. And, uh, you know, and he's trying to stay alive himself. So if you're one, if you're one dude and you know, there's 30 guys in some cattle rustling gang in your area, you're not going to like storm into the saloon and be like, all right, everybody shit's changing around here. (laughs) (laughs) You know, you're just going to be like, please come on guys. Could you please just rob a little bit less? Could you do a little less robbing? Can you play nice with the Hamiltons, please? (laughs) Right, right. Exactly. (laughs) All right, well, cool. Let's take a break. Uh, we're going to take a break here in studio. Uh, Dan, I'm sure you want to get some drink, maybe use the bathroom. We're going to uh, um, come back and deliver the next five from from Dan Cummins. And then uh, at the end of the episode, we'll we'll let's give some plugs and, and whatnot to you. And you're also going to be back down here at the Improv sometime in yeah. June-ish. Yeah, yes. so I'm hoping to come see you guys. Yeah, I'll be there. I can't remember the exact dates, but I'll be in June. I know it's up uh, at dancummins.tv, but I think I think the first first weekend, maybe. I don't know. Well, very cool. All right, so let's take a break, and we will be right back. Village Idiot Pub. You locals know about it. You guys from out of town have to check them out. Village Idiot Pub is now a proud sponsor with Living Podcariously and the Twisted Ten Podcasts. It's more than just about commercials, though. The cast here will be taking our show on the road to Village Idiot to record some episodes as well as hold events. They have over 30 beers on tap, including ciders and Hefeweizen, my favorite, as well as hundreds of bottle choices. Adam, you forgot my favorite, all the delicious wine. (laughs) So get your friends together and enjoy the board games, puzzles, and the giant Jenga. Let the owner Jason, as well as the rest of the staff there, take excellent care of your beer drinking needs. Mention either one of our shows to the staff and get 10% off your tab. Tuesday is open mic, Wednesday is trivia, Thursday is karaoke, Friday and Saturday night are live music. Visit them at 4 Harrison Street, Suite 103, Cocoa, Florida, or Village Idiot Pub on Facebook. And don't forget, they are a dog-friendly location, so bring your friends, family, and fur babies. Hey, it's Adam. If you enjoy the hosts or the content of the Twisted Ten, be sure to check out our other show. It's called Living Podcariously. While the Twisted Ten may get crass and explicit occasionally, it holds no water to Living Podcariously. We do get a little bit more rough and raw on that show. We have a lot of fun producing it and have had some awesome guests. And as always, thanks for listening. Okay, we have 45 seconds before the anesthesia wears off, so we have to make this quick. That's not very good anesthesia. Focus, now. Remember why we're here. Honestly, no. Sandwiches? Soon. Look, we're here to tell the Twisted Ten listeners about our show, The Conversation Hat Podcast in which a hat tells us to talk about geek culture, the arts and the abstract, features guests from the creative industries along with original sketches and music. Oh yeah, I guess we'd mentioned that The Conversation Hat is available on iTunes, SoundCloud and on StabbedPanda.com, right? I really wish we'd scripted this before breaking in. Uh, Liam, they're starting to wake up. Darn, there's no time. Come on, through the window. We forgot the sandwiches. DJ Gildugo is bringing back the old school. Just for cast away, the island lost at sea. Oh, another lonely day, no one here but me. Oh, more loneliness than any man could bear. Rescue me.
and welcome back to the Twisted Ten. Uh, again, thank you very much, Dan Cummins, for guest hosting this really cool Western episode and Western villains. Uh, we appreciate that. So if you want to uh, recap the top ten or the top five, uh, ten through six, just the names of those guys again to, to refresh the listeners as far as who they were. Shuffling through paper, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, we had number 10 was Jesse James. Uh, number nine was Rufus Buck. Number eight is Cherokee Bill Goldsby. I still can't believe that's his name. Uh, number seven is Black Jack Ketchum. That is a proper outlaw name. Yes, it is. And uh, we have number five, James Killer Miller, which is a terrifying name. <laughs> I think I might, uh, I'm just saying, I think I have my... My already? guess picked. You already. still have five more to go. I know. I think I, think I know more. what it is. No internet searches have been happening here for your, I, okay, for good, your names, good. but uh, I think I think I might know. I'm just saying. Jesse James, well, right? Jesse James is the fake one. <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> well, number number five, uh, hopefully you know this is this is not the fake one, is Butch Cassidy. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh. Butch Cassidy of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Uh, now, he's an interesting one. Butch Cassidy apparently never killed anybody. He was uh, just into the money. He was uh, not a killer, not like Killer Miller. And he was, uh, yeah, considered one of the greatest hustlers of the kind of American West. And a really cool kind of mystery about the end of his life, which I'll get into in a second. But he was, uh, he was born Robert Leroy Parker on April 13th, 1866 in Beaver, Utah. What a name. All right. <laughs> Beaver, Utah. And he was the oldest of 13 Mormon children. So he's a Mormon outlaw, which also makes him unusual. Huh. And uh, he found work on a bunch of ranches and stuff as a kid. And then he met this, uh, this local rancher named Mike Cassidy, and he admired him so much, he took on the name of Butch Cassidy. That's where, that's where the, uh, the Cassidy part came in. Um, so by, by all accounts, he was a very charming thief, well-liked, and, uh, and again, never killed anybody. His first taste of robbery came in June 1889 when he and three other cowboys made off with 20000 bucks from the San Miguel Valley Bank in Telluride, Colorado. Another good pull. Yeah, exactly. And Telluride's a really cool. Telluride to this day looks like a Wild West town. If, uh, they do they do a little festival there and stuff, and it's just um, if you ever see a picture of Telluride, Colorado, it has one of those classic main streets where you're like, oh, I could see saloons and gambling halls and little horses and stuff here. Huh. Uh, after purchasing a ranch uh, of his own in Dubois, Wyoming, in 1890, he cont- continued to rustle cattle and horses. And then he was uh, actually caught and uh, jailed for two years uh, in 1894. So he's one of the kind of the few guys that actually served some decent time. And, uh, and kind of an interesting thing about him, despite the criminal background, and it kind of shows why he never tried to escape or anything, he supposedly was really good about keeping his word. So even though he was like a train robber and a bank robber, he was also strangely honorable. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, that's how, like he the, that's how he got the movie. <laughs> exactly. That's how he. That's how he got the uh, three picture deal with MGM or something. Honor yeah. among thieves, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's this one story. I guess like it was the night before he was to begin his his sentence. He'd asked to be released to kind of like hang out with his family before serving his term, and they just they let him go, and then he came back to to, to jail the next day and was like, "All right, I'm ready to serve now." This like, what set uh, the precedence for all Wall Street criminals. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No kidding. Uh, upon his full release in 1896, he returned to crime. Uh, with several other well-known outlaws, including Hera Longbaugh, the Sundance Kid, and uh, William Ellsworth Lay, Elsie Lay, Ben Kilpatrick, the Tall Texan, and Harvey Logan, Kid Curry. I love how these guys have, all have nicknames. Those are awesome gangster names. I'm yeah. just saying. <laughs> Obviously, yeah, Butch the, Cassidy and the Sundance Kid is the, the that's the famous duo that you hear about. Yeah. But uh, every one I kind of like Kid Curry. <laughs> <laughs> Kid Curry. It sounds like, a, like D- I, it sounds like a DJ or a rapper. It does. Now. It yeah. does. It DJ sounds Kit like Curry. yeah. It's a, he, you know, he goes to Vegas a couple times a year, and you know, and puts yeah. on a rave. And, you see him and at South by Southwest, uh, one of the smaller right. towns. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, he does Coachella. He's big in Coachella. Uh, <laughs> beginning in August uh, 1896, he does some bank robberies in Idaho, my home state, Montpelier, Idaho. He ma- they make off more than seven thousand dollars. Then they hit uh, banks and trains in South Dakota, New Mexico, Nevada, Wyoming. Um, and then they have a hideout. I love this in Hole in the Wall Pass in Johnson County, Wyoming. Yep. I think I think every good gang has to have a good hideout. Hole in the Wall Pass. <laughs> and so they have a. Uh, they're called like the Wild Bunch is uh, their gang's name, and and they kind of became famous in their day too. It's like the media kind of liked them. So all the little like local papers around the West are writing about are writing about their bank robberies and train robberies, and you know some of the guys were like good looking. So they became like these kind of again kind of like celebrities, you know, before there was movie stars. So they in the end uh, they 
Oh, each, I'm sorry, each new robbery, the, the bunch becomes better and better known, better liked by the American public. The robberies become bigger. Uh, one of the largest, a $70,000 uh, haul from a train just outside of Folsom, New Mexico. Mm. That's a big one back there. Un- unable to stop the bunch, the Union Pacific Railroad went so far as to propose to Cassidy a pardon in exchange for just him to promise to stop robbing <laughs> the trains. <laughs> just stop. Leave us alone. Uh, we'll, we'll drop the charges. Just stop it. <laughs> <laughs> we can't catch you. Just please. We'll let you live a normal life. Just stop robbing us. And uh, and I guess Cassidy like formally turned the offer down. He was like, I appreciate the offer, but I'm going to keep robbing your stuff. <laughs> Can you imagine <laughs> receiving? Can you imagine receiving that pardon <laughs> offer in the mail? Like, oh, yeah, well, all right. Exactly. So, what what kind of summons am I getting today? Uh, please stop rob- robbing us. We'll let you go, and we won't chase you. And like the nah. smugness that he had, like, ah, you guys are cute. No, nah, that's not gonna. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ah, that, it's way more prof- profitable for me just to continue robbing you guys blind. <laughs> you guys are adorable. I, I love well, it because you're saying like the press was all in it. It's like the first yeah. reality show. And then, yeah, like, and yeah. then Union Pacific was like, "Hey, listen, we need to stop this." And it's like, "We're not canceling. No, we just got renewed for another season. No, no, <laughs> exactly. We're going. Our ratings are off the charts right now. There's no way we're stopping this. The Wyoming <laughs> Express loves us. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Uh, well, the uh, so since they can't make a deal with them, the uh, Union Pacific hires the Pinkertons, and that's those um, kind of like the precursors to modern detectives. Yeah, who would who would track people down anywhere? So the Pinkerton AG, agency chases them actually out of the country all the way to South America. Like these guys end up fleeing all the way down to South America. And uh, there's one story that supposedly they, they rob banks and trains and stuff down in South America as well. And then the Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid lost their lives in a shootout with soldiers, with South American soldiers in Bolivia on November 6, 1908. But other people don't think they died. Uh, the truth has never been fully settled. Some historical evidence suggests that Cassidy faked his death returned to the United States under a new name, William T. Phillips, and spent his final few decades living in Spokane, Washington, uh, not dying until 1937. Hmm. So, so who knows? And eventually, of course, their, their, uh, part of their lives were, was turned into the 1969 Oscar-winning uh, movie Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid with Paul Newman as Butch Cassidy and Robert Redford as the Sundance Kid. So that's kind of one of those interesting ones where did he die or did he not die? As a South American, I can vouch for the ineptitude of the Bolivian army. Um, <laughs> that would have been the only thing the Bolivian army ever killed. <laughs> <laughs> this one guy. That's the one thing they did the, right. The one guy, and, they, and even that's disputed. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, maybe killed him. Yeah. Okay, okay, number four might be my favorite. This is the one where I'm like, God, I kind of wish I would have done this guy instead of Billy the Kid. It's Doc Holliday. Yeah. Oh, nice. I'm, I'm, your, I'm your Huckleberry. Yes, Tombstone is my favorite movie ever, and I didn't do enough research initially on Doc Holliday, and I thought some of the initial things I read kind of made it sound like it was all made up, but I found, digging a little deeper, that, you know, you never know exactly what to believe on these things, because they didn't have the same kind of documentation that we have now, so a lot of stuff is up for kind of grabs as far as did it happen, did it not. I'm going to go with the more adventurous side of uh, journalism. (laughs) because <laughs> uh, it makes for a better story, story with Doc down, Holliday. Calm down now, CNN. The, the Hunter S. Thompson yeah. approach is what we call this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, the fear and loathing approach. Uh, August 14th, 1851, uh, John Henry Doc Holliday is born. Uh, when he's just 15, his mother d- uh, dies of consumption of uh, tuberculosis, and she's probably who gave it to him, because if you've watched Tombstone, you know he's called a lunger. Uh, he had consumption from the time he was about 15 on. And he, uh, he, despite having consumption, he did enroll uh, in college in Philadelphia in 1870. And in 1872, he graduated with a dentist degree. So again, from the movie, he really was uh, a dentist. Oh, wow. And he was also supposedly a hot-tempered guy who was quick with a gun. And um, uh, in October 1873, he, he, he packs up and, and heads for Dallas because he needed to get to a drier climate or kind of head out west. That's what they recommended at the time. All these doctors were like, if you had tuberculosis, they're like, get to the southwest. It's dry. And you'll- it's like bronchi- treating bronchitis at the time. They're like, yeah, it's dry. Yeah. Yep. That's all they had. They, they couldn't cure it, but they're like, it's drier. You'll probably live longer. And uh, uh, But supposedly he has a shooting incident uh, there and then moves uh, – oh, and, and there's different there's different speculation. Some say he moved initially just because of the doctor's thing. Some say it was because he killed a guy in Georgia – and kind of had to flee uh, west to get away from that as well. That's what Bat Matt Matterson ended up saying, or Masterson, a guy who was part of the whole Wyatt Earp mythology later on. 
Uh, initially, he worked uh, with a dentist by the name of Dr. John Seeger in Dallas, but then the coughing spells he would get from tuberculosis, you, you, you can't be a Wild West dentist trying to extract somebody's tooth and then constantly having violent coughs and, like, cut up their face. <laughs> or, or coughing in their mouth, like, hey, listen, we took care oh, of the God, cavity, yeah. but um, FYI, you also have tuberculosis. <laughs> <laughs> so, so even though he has a dental degree, the tuberculosis keeps him from actually getting uh, able to practice on it. And so then he heads uh, further west to, to New Mexico and, and Arizona, and, and he was kind of known around the places he would go for being an unusual character because he was very well educated. He came from a wealthy family. And he could speak Latin. He really could play the piano very well, just like the guy in Tombstone. He was a fancy dresser and, and did have the manners of like a Southern gentleman, just like, you know, Val Kilmer's portrayal. It'd have been kind of interesting to hear if uh, when you're researching for his dentist profession, back yeah. in those days, the dentists were also bloodletters and would, you know, yeah. would do transfusions. I wonder if he tried to, you know, sustain more life, uh, uh, taking blood out of some of his patients oh, and then, yeah. you know, infusing himself with their blood just to try to, you know, try to clean his, himself out. Yeah, there was no record of anything that came up as far as transfusions, but I mean, who knows? Maybe it's like, you know, he probably tried a lot of things to keep himself alive by the very end there. Hmm. Uh, he was he was his intelligence, you know, like if you watch the movie, he's a good gambler, and supposedly that's true. Yeah, supposedly uh, he could count cards. Yep, yep, he was very smart, very good at gambling, and you know, since he couldn't work as a dentist, that's kind of how he began to make his living. And he was a drunk because, you know, he, he knew, especially as a doctor, he was going to die. Like, nobody lived for that long with consumption back then. So he knew he was kind of a dead man walking. And to kind of protect himself from gambling, he did supposedly practice a lot with a six-shooter. And again, like the movie, he did have a long, just wicked-looking knife that he became very proficient with. So he wanted to, even though he was going to die, he wanted to gamble and kind of live as long as possible. And uh, the first account of a gunfight with him was 1875, where he uh, killed a uh, saloon keeper over a little gambling disagreement. And then, so then he had to flee Dallas. Uh, that was where he f first killed his guy. And he makes it, uh, you know, farther west to Fort Richardson, where he, uh, he kills a soldier in another disagreement uh, over gambling. Now a reward is offered for his capture. So now he's pursued by some Texas Rangers. He flees again, makes it to Kansas Territory, which is now part of Colorado. And uh, it makes stops along the way in Pueblo, Leadville, Georgetown, Central City, where he leaves three more dead bodies. Uh, he finally settles in Denver for a time. He assumed the name of Tom Mackey. Uh, he was dealing Pharaoh at this place called Babbitt's House. And uh, he basically got in a disagreement at a gambling table and this time used his knife and nearly cut the dude's head off, uh, who he was having a problem with. Townsfolk didn't appreciate that. Public re... Uh, <laughs> no, so, they frowned yeah. on that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> they, fr they frowned on that. They frowned. They thought it was a little much. And uh, now he gets to, to New Mexico, where he meets Wyatt Earp, just like the movie, and where he meets that lady that was his girlfriend in the movie who was known as Big Nose Kate, which is a horrible nickname for a woman. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> uh, supposedly she was beautiful. She was a, uh, a prostitute um, and kind of gambler herself who was very pretty but did have a prominent nose. So she got the uh, sad nickname of Big Nose Kate. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then all the kind of stuff, you know, I, I, I won't go into all the detail because a lot of it is from the movie, but all that stuff where the confrontation with like Curly Bill Brocious and Johnny Ringo, uh, there wasn't a showdown with Johnny Ringo like the movie, but he did get in some shootouts, you know, the OK Corral, the shootouts with the cowboy gang. That did happen. He did join up with Wyatt Earp to track down some of the cowboys. Uh, and he did kill a number of those guys in some of the shootouts, and he did end up dying back in Colorado uh, of tuberculosis. And I thought this was interesting that his his last words here um, were as he's dying in that uh, uh, this Denver kind of uh, what they call them. They were places where you went with uh, when you had consumption. It was oh, I should have wrote down the word brothel. It was, it's, it, no, it was, it was like a hospital, but it was like a hospital specifically for people who had consumption. And it was just for them to kind of like have open air and live a little bit long. Sanatorium. Yes. Ah, yes. Okay. Sanatorium. And I guess his uh, his last words uh, were like, as he felt, I guess his body start to go, he just like looked down at his feet and just says, isn't that funny? Like uh, kind of like that final scene they have, like with him talking to Wyatt Earp. He just, he always assumed he would die in some kind of gunfight or something and not just laying in a hospital bed. Yeah, huh? And and they were friends to the very end, him and Wyatt Earp. So that stuff is true, and uh, and also Doc Holliday leads us to number three, uh, which is another true guy. Uh, you know, maybe. Yeah, yeah if you trust me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another another cast member of Tombstone, and that's Curly Bill. 
And if you remember him, Curly Bill Brocious, that, that's the guy who was like above Johnny Ringo in Tombstone. He was like the head of the cowboy gang. And he was he was uh, he was born in uh, 1841, dead by 1882. Gunman, cattle rustler, outlaw, and uh, he was in a, he was in a number of conflicts with lawmen of the Earp family. That's kind of what he was known for. Um, he was uh, one of the guys who killed Morgan Earp, uh, Wyatt Earp's brother. And he was also uh, uh, he was eventually killed by Wyatt Earp. Uh, and that scene in Tombstone, where they have the big shootout in the river where Curly Bill is shooting uh, at, at, at Wyatt Earp, and then Wyatt Earp supposedly kind of marches forward. Supposedly there's some truth to that. I'm sure made more dramatic for Hollywood. Right. Sure. But he did fire numerous times at Wyatt, missed, and then Wyatt just got him at close range. Oh, wow. So that is, that is, and the thing, there's that thing where he was put in jail earlier in the movie for uh, killing the sheriff, Sheriff White, that old man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Where he kind of, Sheriff White's trying to disarm him, and then all of a sudden he flips his gun around at the last minute and shoots that guy in the head. Or not the guy in the head, but shoots him in the stomach or wherever it was. That supposedly also is true, and he really was taken to trial for that. And then basically he got off on that because they said they couldn't prove it was intentional. He claimed it was a misfire. Hmm. So uh, Curly Bill, his his story. How would you like to use that excuse every time you get you're in a gunfight and you miss? It was a misfire. It uh, it went off by itself. Uh, it was yeah, an accident. exactly, exactly. It's a hell of a defense to have. That's oh no. There's a there's actually a legal defense. It's called the Shaggy defense. And it, it, it be, it's based off the song, It Wasn't Me. It is denying guilt in the face of just so much evidence against you. Huh. And it is actually deemed the Shaggy defense. That is a Seriously? real thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not doing that the twist. Awesome. I have no twist. That is a real thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, the next guy, uh, number two on the list, was not part of the Tombstone mythology. Uh, I like his nickname, though. John Sidewinder Dalton. Nice. And uh, he was Virginia City's most infamous gunslinger, uh, born Jonathan Michael Dalton. Not as exciting uh, a name, name initially. <laughs> and, I don't know, that's a manly uh, man's name. I'm John Dalton. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. John Dalton. I know. It reminds me of, uh, isn't it? Isn't uh, Roadhouse, isn't Dalton? And, it's Dalton, right? Swayze's character? Yeah, it is Dalton. What's his first yeah. name in that? I don't know. I watched yeah, I think he's just known as Dalton. I think yeah. he's just yeah, called Dalton. <laughs> yeah. Rips the guy's throat. Uh, best, best scene. Oh, yeah, yeah. Exactly. The throat rip. Oh, my God. Well, he's born into a comfortable life, kind of like Doc Holliday. Uh, his mom was a school teacher. Uh, dad was a banker. Uh, wanted John to follow in his footsteps. However, uh, he wanted a life of adventure. And at 17, he went to work on the uh, Central Pacific Railroad. And life on the Central Pacific brought him all the way out to Promontory Point, Utah, which was the end of the railroad at that time in 1860. Uh, met a group of men heading to Virginia City, Nevada to find silver. There was the Comstock load. Uh, that was a huge silver strike, like America's biggest. And it was hit in 1859, and so he went out there to kind of prospect and make his kind of mining money. And he did hit a small load of his own in May of uh, 1861, but then uh, had his fortune wiped out when the Virginia City Bank he deposited all his money in was hit by the Unger's gang and wiped out. And he was, uh, this is kind of where he shifted in life. He was not happy. This is before they had the FDIC kind of protecting your assets. If uh, if the bank lost the money, they were just like, sorry, buddy, you're broke now. Yep. (laughs) You shit out of luck. And so uh, he, not content to let his money disappear, he tracks one of the Ungers, Jesse Unger, to a hideout nearby Gold Hill and shoots Jesse dead, uh, but does not recover his money. And, uh, and apparently uh, he shot Jesse in the back. And so because of that, he was charged with murder. It's like one of those kind of Wild West things where if you, if you shoot a man face to face, maybe it was a fair draw. You shoot a guy in the back, you're a murderer. You know, this, and- it, 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 technicalities mean everything <laughs> exactly exactly it's like the previous guy it's like you know the gun the gun went off accidentally <laughs> <laughs> it was an accident it went off by itself but i got my money back. Of, well no he did a lot of technicalities back then uh and but also uh, the local sheriff uh pap anderson uh was considered did you say cr- pap? he was pap pap anderson uh these guys have some name. fun little names <laughs> y'all are like a bunch of little third grade boys <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know. They like they like their nicknames back then. They were really into them. Yeah, you never you'll never let this down, Mister Pap Smear Anderson. <laughs> Mister Pap Pap Smear. That would be a tough Pap Smear. That's a, that's a bank robber you don't mess with. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, so uh, th- this guy was supposedly in the pockets of the Unger Gang a little bit, and that kind of helped him get uh, a reward put on his head. So now he's an outlaw. Now he can't find honest work. Uh, and he acquired the Sidewinder nickname when a prospector and gun battle witness told authorities, quote, he moved like a Sidewinder across the mesa, firing shots and moving with a rapidness that made it damn near impossible to return fire. So he was a, he was a quick fella. Hmm. 
And uh, he ends up robbing like kind of other uh, mines in the area. Most of the owners of the mines he robbed were associated somehow with either Sheriff Anderson or the Unger brother uh, gang, the remaining uh, guy, George. George Unger, between the years of 1861 and 1864, uh, he's said to have robbed about $30,000 worth of cash and loot. So not like uh, Butch Cassidy, but he, he did all right. And uh, he, infi- he finally encountered George Unger in a saloon in Emma's Peak, Nevada, on November 3rd, 1864, acting on a tip from Pap. Uh, Sh- George and a few remaining members of the gang snuck into the Silver Dollar Saloon, where they found Dalton playing tarot with his back to the door. Before Dalton ever turned and saw Unger and the other two men he was in, uh, came in with, George called out, so what were Jesse's final words, or did you I- even give him time to s- uh, speak, you sneaky son of a bitch? <laughs> uh, recognizing George's voice, Dalton spun, tried to get a shot off, but George already had his gun drawn, and, uh, and I guess he was shot about 12 times between George and Frank Hardy and Elliot Stein, two of the other Unger gang members, and fell dead to the floor. Uh, never got to have any final words. He didn't have time to get him out. Uh, and he only, he only made it to 23 years old. Ooh. So yeah, a lot of these guys, a lot of these guys, but he did live longer than number one on the list, which was the topic of time suck this week. And that's Billy, the kid, Billy, the kid only lived 21 years, uh, which is crazy to me. The amount of life he lived in 21 years. He was born, uh, William Bonnie, uh, actually was, uh, I'm sorry. He was born Henry McCarty, then became William Bonnie then became Billy the Kid. Uh, a lot of these guys changed their names back then. He's born in 1859. Uh, his mom also had uh, tuberculosis, also died of consumption when he was young. His dad was dead, uh, I think, like by the time he was a toddler. He never knew his dad. And so he was on his own uh, very young. He had a stepdad, but the stepdad left. And so he's on his own at like 13 in, uh, in New Mexico. And his kind of... I can think, I feel like I can go off book here. I'm so I got so much of his stuff in my head. <laughs> yeah, uh, have you already recorded the episode for Billy the Kid? I did. I did. Yeah, Billy the Kid's out right now. Yeah. Oh, is it? Uh, All right. Yeah. Yeah. It just came out today, and um, so he he is like I don't know, like 13. He's on his own. He's working at this little local kind of restaurant, and his first crime he's convicted of was kind of like a stupid kid crime. Some older outlaw talked him into stealing some clothes from a nearby laundry kind of place. He does it. He gets caught. The guy lets him off with uh, a warning initially. But now he's got a little bit of a taste. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. That was the second one. The butter. That was even funnier. The first thing he stole was butter. He stole butter from a local rancher. I guess he could, and, and he, tried, he tried selling it to a local store. That, that's such a teenage crime. I'm going to make <laughs> some b- butter money. Yep. <laughs> Gets a warning for that. The second time, he is not let off with a warning. And uh, they hold him in jail, and he escapes. He was really good, it turns out, at escaping from prison and in jail. Uh, he escapes, and now he's you know just a young teenager on his own. And... Uh, Trying to trying to make his way in the New Mexico in the 1870s, which is terrifying, and uh, and he's afraid to try and get honest work because he's small for his age and he's really young. He ends up falling uh, falling in with this um, oh uh, he, I'm sorry he becomes a, a civilian teamster initially at Camp Grant Army Post. So he's trying to haul some logs, and there's this guy. This guy has the best nickname ever, Frank Windy Cahill. Windy Cahill. <laughs> sounds, sounds like a guy who farts a lot and uh this guy picks on him i guess and his first murder is he just gets sick of wendy's shit <laughs> and while and while they're wrestling he uh pulls his gun and just gut shots him he's like this guy had slapped him around several times before and he was not taken at this day he shoots this guy he gets uh taken into custody and escapes again before trial can start so now he's killed somebody and uh, and now he really has a hard time finding regular work. And he, and he that's like that Michael Douglas movie where he gets fired and he just goes on a shooting spree. Like, oh I just yeah, will yeah, not yeah. Stand uh, today. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, I'll never remember the name of that movie. <laughs> is it Walking Walking Tall? No, uh, Standing Tall. Oh my God, what is that movie? I'm I'm, I can, I'm gonna look it up. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I can I, 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 I can picture the scene when he leaves his car in traffic right now. Yeah, <laughs> but he uh, he uh, ends up with this cattle rustling gang called the Boys. And um, he reluctantly joins their gang, can't find any other work. And then he gets arrested for stealing cattle by this guy named John Tunstall. And this was uh, back in the day, though, when it was hard to find good ranch hands. And the guy who he stole the cattle from says, hey, I'm not going to press charges if you'll work for me. So instead of stealing my cattle, I'll give you an actual job. Wow. And this becomes a, a big deal for him. It's the first guy who gave him an opportunity. Uh, he loves this guy, Tunstall, respects him as a boss. And this guy, Tunstall, uh, is in Lincoln County, New Mexico, very lawless, and his cattle ranch is kind of a competing ranch with this other group. They call themselves The House, these Irish guys. 
And the house wants Tunstall to get the hell out of their area and let them control the whole thing. And so uh, basically the house hires some people, uh, Tunstall hires some people. And for the next several years, there's a war between these two cattle ranches. And during this war, Billy the Kid kills uh, a local sheriff this, uh, and a couple deputies. And now he becomes wanted. And then the governor of New Mexico is getting tired of this war and says, I'll give amnesty if you guys will just stop uh, unless you have current indictments against you. Well, Billy has an indictment. He's wanted for murder of the sheriff, so it doesn't apply to him. So everybody else gets a pardon, essentially. Oh, he doesn't. sucks. Sucks for him. He tries to reach out to the governor and say, man, I don't want to be killing people anymore. I want to be done. And the governor says, well, if you testify against some of the other people that were doing some of these things, I'll let you off. He agrees, testifies, and then basically they're like, nope, uh, just, ki- just kidding. Uh, we're not going to let you off. So then he escapes again from prison. Now he's now got she- a vengeance. Yeah, now, exactly. Now he's vengeance. He's pissed. He ends up killing several people who uh, killed people that he was in this gang with uh, when they were having that Lincoln County War. Eventually, Sheriff Pat Garrett catches him and his posse, takes him to jail. He's tried for murder. They're going to hang him. While awaiting, uh, waiting to be hung, he manages to escape yet again, and this time he shoots his way out. Uh, somebody sneaks him a pistol in this outhouse, is the, the, the theory. When he, when he goes to go to the bathroom, he's taken to the outhouse outside of the courthouse. He gets his pistol, sneaks it, comes back in, uh, slips one of his handcuffs, punches one of the deputies that's in there in the face, shoots him dead. The other deputy had set outside the building. That deputy tries coming back in. He ran up to the armory, got a shotgun. When the guy's coming back and basically yelling, have you seen Billy? He, he uh, supposedly stands up in the window, goes, hi, Bob. And when the guy looks up at him, he blasts him in the face with a shotgun. Jesus. <laughs> his, his breakout was, was choreographed by John Woo. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Oh, and Falling Down was the name of that. that falling uh, Down. Michael Douglas. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay, thank yeah. you. <laughs> Well, he lives on the lam for a few months, and then finally Sh- uh, Sheriff Pat Garrett catches up with him in Fort Sumner, New Mexico, and supposedly uh, Pat Garrett is interviewing somebody else about his whereabouts, and then as he's interviewing this guy in this little apartment, essentially, Billy the Kid walks into the doorway, and, uh, and it's dark, it's at night, so they're like candlelit, so as he sees him approach, Sheriff Pat Garrett sneaks back into the shadows, and then as Billy comes through the doorway, he's trying to see if anybody, he hears something, and, he, and his last words were, Kienes. Quién is? You know, like, like, who is it? Mm-hmm. Who is it? And Sheriff Pat Garrett, this guy has escaped four times. He's not taking any chances, and he just lights him up. So he never saw it coming. His death was pretty un unceremonial. Oh wow! Yeah, I remember. I remember hearing Billy the Kid spoke Spanish. So that, yeah, that yeah, yep, totally fits. Yeah. So, so that is that. That is the ten. So out of those ten, uh, and I can give a recap here. Yeah, run through the names of the of the ten again, because I'm pretty sure I've got it. I, I think I know. Okay. I think I know who. I think I know the <laughs> so, fake one. So ten is Jesse James. Nine is Rufus Buck. Eight is Cherokee Bill Goldsby. I love saying his last name with Cherokee Bill. Seven is Black Jack Ketchum, and then number six is James Killer Miller. Number five is Butch Cassidy. Uh, number four is Doc Holliday. Number three is, sorry, I had too much stuff, is Curly Bill Brocious. Number two is John Sidewinder Dalton. And number one is Billy the Kid. Mm. All right, what do you guys think? Right. Now, I wanted to say, Doc, and that if it wasn't for the fact that I know Doc Holliday's a real person, only because he outran the Texas Rangers and no one survives an encounter with Chuck Norris. So let's just... <laughs> But then Doc Holiday is Doc Holiday. I'm I gotta go with Sidewinder. I think You're Sidewinder. Sidewinder? Maybe made up. What about you, Andrea? I'm still debating between two. In in the era where they all make up their own really kick ass names, you know, they they can rename themselves and then give themselves their I'm own thinking, nicknames. I'm thinking Rufus. That's the first one I was gonna go with because if you've got Jack if you've got a name like Rufus, yeah, see that could that could be good. Dan could have spun yeah. this to be Blackjack. Could have been the made up one because it's got a cool nickname and we would overlook it. I'm going to go Rufus as well, though. I think I'm going to go Rufus as the made-up one. So, Andrew, what are you going with? I had picked Rufus, but he picked it too, so maybe I should go with Blackjack Ketchum. So we all have different ones. So you got one for Blackjack, one for Rufus, and then you got me for Sidewinder. Okay, well, one of you is correct. It's Sidewinder. Sidewinder, Sidewinder is the made-up uh, one. So Jay yes. wins. Nice. Jay wins. Yes. You almost spilled your beer. He's I, so excited. I almost did. I don't win much. Don't take this from me. I don't have a lot. 
Uh, well, hopefully that hopefully that was okay, but it was it was it was a crazy amount of people to look up. So hopefully that made sense. Well, but, uh, let me put it this way: you set the bar for a guest host very very high. For, yeah, you did <laughs> for your amount of research and just the the entertainment factor and. You know, it, it was it was a very very good episode, and oh well, that's good. Thanks, man. You know, it was it was fun to do. It's such a fascinating period of history. It's like, uh, and it was cool researching it because, again, I thought Hollywood kind of made most of that stuff up, but it, it apparently it really was just an insane, lawless kind of chaotic, chaotic uh, time in history where, yeah, where you can actually make one up, and even the, like they thought, well, no, that one seems legit. Let's go <laughs> yeah. for the real. Right. <laughs> it's just so so much craziness happened. Yeah, it's easy to make oh, one yeah. up, and just kind of we'll, we'll fit that. That in there we'll see how that goes oh, uh, <laughs> i mean i i think if i was listening i might even think like killer miller was made up like yeah, that guy like, like third choice. some yep. some weird assassin who just like never drank or smoked he seems like a character in a movie i, I did because I, I actually have heard of killer miller and when i oh, really when you, you asked me and i said no because i didn't want to give it away i was like because oh, i knew one was a twist nice i didn't, so, I, didn't but, I didn't want and to be- i had to catch myself because you said killer miller i was like yeah i did a report on uh my favorite assassins at a, oh, dark, no in a darker part of my life, and Killer Miller came up in it. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't want it to be Killer Miller because I was fat. That out of all of the stories, yeah. short of the ones that we've seen, you know, Hollywood redo, that one was the most fascinating to me. That that whole story behind, especially when he he's <laughs> oh, an yeah. owner of a saloon and the consummate professional. That's that's what he was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is crazy. Well, that's really uh, cool. Yeah, and I might do a time suck about him. And thanks for letting me promote that too. If anybody likes, you know, likes these stories, you know, I just do kind of one for your listeners. You know, like one subject each week. Uh, yeah, Billy the Kids this week, but it's, you know, it's been, it's not always people. Sometimes it's like flat earth theory was an episode. Uh, another one was Elon Musk and, and his mission to Mars, you know, and another one was artificial intelligence. So. Yeah, no, it's such a cool idea to just take some rant. It's like, cause it's me when I go, when I, it's basically you falling into a black hole or a rabbit yeah, exactly. hole. Like I remember once I was looking up hotel rates in Los Angeles and I ended up looking up the rate of recidivism in Finland. I don't know why. Ah. I don't know how. I didn't even know what recidivism meant when I started yeah. looking at hotel rates, but I know it now and I'm pretty well versed in the in the fin, in the Finnish penal system. That's hilarious. Yeah. But yeah, no, it's, no it's, it's, I that, love that I, idea. Well, I was doing it anyway on some level, and that's why I wanted to do it as a podcast. It's like I just, yeah, I, I would try take a break from doing whatever work I'm supposed to be doing and just <laughs> look something up, or I'd be like reading an ESPN or article and all of a sudden like you know uh oj simpson pops up and so then i click on him and then i'm reading his wikipedia page and then somebody else that he was associated with comes up and then i click on that link and then yeah and then 15 minutes later i'm i'm reading about you know uh sea monsters somehow <laughs> like, what the hell <laughs> when i was when i was a kid my parents whenever i would act up to punish us they would get yeah. you know they would make us write out of the encyclopedia we had a whole volume of the world book encyclopedia and they didn't make a, they didn't tell wow. us what to write they would just you know, right out of yeah. the encyclopedia for the next two hours. That's great. So, you know, at the end of every encyclopedia article, it says, see also. So I got really into stuff and it, it's really cool finding yeah. that now. And like, oh, I'll just go listen to this and see what rabbit hole I can find myself at the bottom of. Did yeah, you have it's, all the letters fun. for the encyclopedia? We did. S was a fucking nightmare. Wow. <laughs> oh we, we, were, we got ours from the grocery store, so we never got very many. You know, they had like one book for so much and you could go back. So it's a different life in Miami and Oklahoma. We never got as many. We had like half of them. Some of the other episodes uh, of Time Suck that Dan Cummins has out there, I was amazed with. uh, Your very first episode was Lizard Illuminati Conspiracy. Oh, yeah. I still think think Trump is a lizard man. (laughs) (laughs) And the the orange alligator didn't help. (laughs) <laughs> exactly exactly he's got the the uh the great uh clown scare of 2016 um uh Cor- a cory haim episode uh and robots and artificial intelligence um you've got the the entire episode on elon musk's mars missions which is absolutely fascinating uh krampus there, i mean there's a ton of them and there here's the other cool thing that you do that is a really neat way to promote it especially for your listeners for Every you release one a week, un- unless yeah. you have uh, you get a hundred new ratings and and subscriptions or whatever on iTunes, yeah, then you yeah. release a bonus episode. So he's got a, a, a few bonus episodes after he's hit a hundred. Uh, 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 what do you call it? five yeah, star reviews fun. on? That. Yeah, it's cool. So absolutely, I think, I think I'll be doing another bonus one in a in a next week. Uh, it looks like it's getting close, and I kind of like have, have been saying in advance what it's going to be. And this one's about uh, Hitler's rise to power in the thirties because it's like. Yeah. I don't know. You know, every time there's a new president, they say like they make comparisons to Hitler. And so I just wanted to look into, you know, is there any truth to that? Not ne- it's not necessarily about like Trump or anything. I, I'm not trying to get partisan. Right, right. But it's just but it's but I think it's just a good thing to be familiar with. And it is so scary 
uh, you know, what they did back in Germany and how they kept so many things hidden from people. They, they shut down the media. They controlled the narrative. And just under people's noses, all these horrible laws were getting passed. Yep. And then by the time it got kind of like, uh, you know, in, a, in an obviously evil direction, it was almost too late. And they created such fear and people were scared to report because they didn't want to get in trouble. And oh, it was, it's just terif- it's we terrifying. We talked a little bit about on, uh, uh, Hitler in one of the villain episodes in the past on, on The uh, Twisted yeah. Ten. And, you know, he started out as a pretty good guy. He did some things. I mean, granted, his, his bads greatly right. outweigh the, the goods. Yeah, but yeah, he yeah. started out as an animal activist and he would, you know, pass all these giant laws on uh, uh, animal abuse and, you yeah. know, in, in support of treating animals with, you know, better care than they did back then. But yeah. Yeah. Jewish yeah. animals. There's a, not Jewish animals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no. no they're, 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 <laughs> there's, a, there's actually a local comic out here. I'll give him a shout out real quick. Chris Green does a great bit about Hitler. And that's odd that one would say that. Um, but it's also yeah, like, yeah, could you yeah. imagine how things, how different things would have been if somebody would have just liked one of his paintings? Like, you, <laughs> exactly. This is a, an original Hitler. Uh, he is, of <laughs> yeah, course, the yeah. only artist no, famous for painting Happy Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I know it is. It is weird how just you know certain events, you know, or or if he wouldn't have been uh, sent to prison for those four years for um, oh he tried to kind of like stage a little minor coup but then it was like while he was in prison that he formulated his whole mind comp and got really super anti-semitic and like went on but it's like you know it, it is weird when you look into history where it's like god if yeah like you said if he would have uh, been a more successful artist if he would have not got went to jail here and, and yeah none of it would have happened if it would have been a little Jewish art dealer that would have picked him up one day <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no kidding exactly or if Billy the Kid had actually been pardoned then maybe <laughs> Maybe things would have been different. I Maybe could just things see the would have been different. Comedy movies, Adolf and Jaime. Like that's all I'm seeing, right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, well, th- well, thank you guys so much for you guys have a really fun podcast, man. And I mentioned it on mine for sure, and I'll mention it again in the future. It's just uh, I love a top ten list, and I love that you guys, yeah, put a twist on it. Well, that rocks. Yeah, yeah we appreciate that. Uh, again, by far, you set the bar pretty high for any future guests that we've got. That was an excellent episode. Uh, um, oh, if thank we can you. ever do anything to help you out, uh, promote you down here or whatever, when you come down here in June, we're yeah. gonna come see your special over in. Uh, at the Improv Orlando, right? That's where you're going to be. Yeah, yeah, I'll be at the Improv in Orlando, and uh, yeah, and I'll have a. I think I'm going to get a car that week, and yeah, I can come. Uh, I know you guys do another podcast, and maybe we can figure something else out. Yeah, we we oh, host yeah. uh, Living Pod Curiously out here. It's a little bit more crass. It's a uh, it's Sweet. real similar to Tom and Dan, which you did over in Orlando already. Yeah. Uh, we're friends with them. Uh, we do a, yeah. a few events together with them, and uh, yeah, we would love to do a. That's more of a formal sit down interview kind of kind of show, uh, not oh, formal okay, yeah. I say, but it, that's more <laughs> where we would do the actual interview and your you know w- what got you from where you were then to where you are now. Cool. Uh, AKA yeah. Jay asking you for every tip you can give. <laughs> <laughs> no, we appreciate you coming on being a good sport. And then again, great list, man. That's, that was, oh, that, thanks, was awesome. that was fantastic. Uh, cool. Yeah. Oh, check oh. out time suck. Um, comedy central special and, uh, get in the internet, uh, black hole that I got into on YouTube. Cause, uh, you got a ton of good, ton of good material out there. Oh, thanks and, man. Uh, thank we you, would be honored you very if much, you know, when this episode posts, you share it on, on your social media. That, oh, that would, absolutely, would be absolutely, absolutely honored for that. But, uh, well, Jay, Adam, and Andrea, thank you very much, and say hi to Tach. Uh, how do you say his name? Is it, is it Tack? I always want to say Tach, but it's Tack. It's, it's always going to be Tach. Tach. No, you said it right. It's Tach. <laughs> We're going to get Holly in on no this one, too. Tack. We'll get his girlfriend in. <laughs> and maybe if we can time it good, uh, we sometimes get extra passes out to some of the launches. If you're down here around the same time as a launch, oh, we can take yeah. you out to the that vehicle assembly cool. building or something out there to, to watch it in person. He yeah. didn't even offer yeah. me that, but that's, that's, <laughs> that's cool, Adam. That's <laughs> Right. Yeah, not not every day you get a NASA invitation. That'd be very cool. <laughs> or space or SpaceX. <laughs> yeah. And I work in a spa, so maybe massage, pedicure, day of beauty. I that would actually probably be better than NASA. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right. Well, cool. All right. Well, we're gonna call it an episode. Don't hang up on the the call okay. yet. I'll work out some of the details with you here in just a second. Check out our Facebook page, facebook.com slash the twisted ten. Uh, follow us on social media for Twitter. It's at the twisted ten on Twitter. And uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Uh, and podcast radio network on Thursdays. Thursdays for this show. Thursdays. I think Thursdays. <laughs> Maybe Thursday. I can't remember that schedule. We'll, we'll insert that in later. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> we just switch shows. Other ones Wednesday. We're syndicated, so this will go out across uh, another radio oh, cool. outlet in Central Florida as well. So and listen awesome. to us on podcast radio network Thursdays at eight p.m. That's right. All right. Well, very cool. So uh, Dan, thank you very much for for coming on tonight. We appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Stay warm. Hey.
Haley is bored. Bored with life and endlessly looking for a purpose and her place in the universe. She knows there's more out there than working nine to five. She never imagined going on one job interview would change everything and open doors she never knew existed. Ancient family journals, two friends, and an irresistible bloodlust to deal with. Turns out being a vampire isn't as sexy as she thought it would be. Between the monster, late night bloodbaths, and a vengeful ex-love of her man, it keeps her busy. But it doesn't have to be this way, does it? Does it? Should she live free and forever without responsibilities? Or will she find the direction she's been looking for? One thing she does know is that she will fight fight for what she wants and create the perfect life without traditional vampire restrictions. And she won't let anyone or anything get in her way. Order your copy of the novel First Generation Book One by Zoe Emerson on Amazon. Available on paperback and Kindle. For more information, go to zoeemerson.com. $1,000. We ain't so cheap. After, <laughs> yeah. After breakfast on April 3rd, 1882, Jesse turned to straighten a picture on the wall of his home. And uh, Bob, one of his longtime gang members, uh, Bob Ford, shot him in the back of the head. Oh. So he was dead instantly at the age of 34 years old. By his own crew. By his own crew. So, By his yeah. own Nowadays, crew. Nowadays, you just have to worry about someone turning snitch back then. Nah, bullet to the head. Bullet to the head, man. Bullet to... Man, people just got... That's what I've learned doing this list. People got shot all of the time back then. <laughs> like, there was just so much shooting uh, in, in, the, in the Wild West. <laughs> Now was there was it for a reward? What did he what did he shoot him for? Yeah, twenty five thousand dollars for reward. the reward. Yep, twenty five grand. I mean, and, and you know, and and you think about that over twenty two years of robberies, they made a total of two hundred thousand dollars. So twenty five grand in one bullet was a tremendous amount of money, you know, for these guys. Yeah, good point. Yeah, that's exactly yeah, so. what the FBI or whoever whoever the hell the the you know county uh, uh, sheriffs or whoever put the bounty up for it was hoping. Yeah. That's exactly yeah, what they were hoping yeah, for. Yeah. So wait, gotta, but wouldn't he have had a warrant too if he was also part of the gang? Like, did he report that and get the reward and then get arrested? <laughs> you know what's funny is, I like it didn't say specifically on that, but it's like it was an interesting time where it's. It, I feel like it's kind of comparable to like a lower level gang member today. It's like if you rat out the guy at the top, right? You get you get amnesty. And, you know, like, you don't serve time. So I think it was a deal where it's like, you you get him, uh-huh. and yeah, we'll give you the reward, and we'll forget about what you did. We, we want the head of the snake dead. So he copped a plea that included murder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. Which is a worse basically. crime than bank robbery. <laughs> so right, if they right. were on this right. spree for 22 years, and he was 34, he was 12 when he started? Oh, you know what? You know what? That's a that's a very good point. Like, uh, he couldn't have been the initial uh, leader. So I think the younger gang started, and then he joined in and became the James Younger Gang. Because absolutely, yeah, that would be. But you know what's weird? A lot of these guys, like Jesse, uh, Billy the Kid, we're going to listen to later, did start when they were like 14, 15 years old. They well, I guess up- girls were getting married when they were, you know, twelve yeah. back then. Well, so they were, you're an adult. Well, I remember like doing a thing on uh, Houdini later, and Houdini like left home to provide. Uh, to like go get work and send money home to his family when he was 12. So it's like these guys, it was a very, children were not protected the same way they are now. Yeah, different <laughs> different time. Too bad. Yeah, I love the Houdini yeah. episode. That was a great time suck episode, by the way. Yeah, it was a, a learning experience where I remember thinking about my son. My son's 11, and he couldn't survive 90 minutes on his own in the real world. <laughs> my, my son is also 11. And my if he daughter had a, is 11. <laughs> yeah. it, it, I can't. Idea. I hadn't heard of some of these people. And some of the people I had heard of, and I thought all their stuff was Hollywood kind of nonsense, it, it turned out there was a lot of truth to the stories. It was just such a crazy era, like late 19th century Wild West. Cool. Yeah. And so, so my list, just to give you guys the twist, uh, it's, uh, it's 10 various Wild West outlaws. One of them is complete and utter nonsense. One of these people is not real. Mm. <laughs> nice. Awesome. He's wonder bringing if us my a relative twist. is in there. Oh, what? Who are you related to? Jesse James. Jesse James is, is, is the first one I'm going to bring up. No kidding. Oh, yeah. My family. I call that one fake. <laughs> that's the one that's fake. No, I'm kidding. There was no Jesse one. James. So let's, well, let's get into Jesse James then. So let's, uh, he, he's, he's number 10. Number 10. 10. Yes. 
Number 10. So I'm going to give a various amount of info. Some of these people more info than others. Uh, but let's, but Jesse James, he was a bank uh, and train robber in the American uh, Wild West, uh, known for leading uh, the members of the James Younger Gang of Outlaws. He was born in September 5th, uh, 1847 in Kearney, Missouri, and he and his brother Frank served for the Confederate Army before uh, embarking on their criminal careers. And they made a name for themselves as kind of like the premier, I guess, uh, bank robbers uh, of their day and train robbers. And there's there's kind of like this mythology that they were like Robin Hood, where they would like steal and then give to the poor. Uh, turns out that's that's nonsense. Uh, they, <laughs> <laughs> they did the stealing part. Uh, the stealing part is totally true. But then when it came to giving to the poor, they're like, ah, let's, let's skip that part of the Robin Hood mythology and, <laughs> nice. and just keep the money. So uh, from 1860 all the way to 1882, they had an especially long career. Uh, they were the most feared kind of outlaws as far as robbers in American history, responsible for more than 20 bank and train robberies. The murders of countless individuals stole an estimated 200 grand, which would be well over uh, 2 million in today's dollars. But it, that doesn't really translate that well, though, because even though it'd only be over 2 million in today's dollars, you could do a lot more with $200,000 in the late 19th century than you could with 2 million today. Yeah. Right. Like it, it was a tremendous amount of money as far as what goods you could buy and land and all that well, kind of like stuff. Well, it's like the, in, in the th- A Million Ways to Die in the West. Have you ever seen that? They say, yeah. you know, when one guy holds up an actual dollar bill. That's a right. dollar right there, you know. Oh yeah, it's unheard of oh, yeah. to see those things. Yeah, money went a long, long ways. I mean, like you could buy land for like twenty bucks, you know, that kind of stuff. And uh, in 1879, the James brothers they had planned uh, one more robbery uh, with Charlie and Robert Ford, two of the members. Uh, little did they know that the governor of Missouri had put together a reward so large, twenty five thousand dollars, on your uh, relative Andrea, his head. <laughs> Is it 20? That, that's a ton of money. Twenty five thousand. Uh, twenty five thousand. The people are super friendly. It's uh, it's pretty. It's it's laid back. I, I love it. Nice. But it's snowing. But it is snowing. That's too it's, cold. <laughs> yeah, it's been a hard winter too this year. It, it, there's literally the snow has not left the ground since er, uh, early November. Oh my god. We drove to South bombarded. Carolina this last weekend to visit some relatives and uh that was cold enough for me. It was in the the low 30s and let me tell you, that chills me to the bone. I I am not happy in that weather. Uh you would not you would not be cut out for Coeur d'Alene then. That's uh, I, I'm like uh, low 30s in the winter. That's wow, what a beautiful day. <laughs> <laughs> they were just yeah. commenting how warm it's been in uh Chicago. They actually went through the 1st January and February without any snow on record. You know, I was just in Chicago at a club called Zanies like 2 weekends ago. And uh, all I needed was a hoodie for the whole week. It was crazy. I, I leave, you know, because Chicago is usually pretty brutal in the winter. And uh, I, I think I want to say it reached 60 degrees one day. It was insane. Oh, wow. Oh, that's a party. Yeah, it was nice. And not even, and not even windy. Not even windy for once. 60 so is freezing. So for our listeners real quick, uh, yeah. Dan Cummins, if you haven't heard of him, he hosts a podcast called Time Suck. Uh, we'll put it in the show notes as well, but you can find it in Google. You can find it in uh, Google Play. You can find it in iTunes, Stitcher, all the typical places you're going to find a podcast. Same place you find this one, you'll find Time Suck. It is a fantastic podcast. I've binge listened to all, what, 24, 25 episodes that are out so far. Yeah, yeah thanks. He also does, Dan does uh, stand-up. Um, you might have seen him on shows like uh, the Jay Leno show or the Conan uh, O'Brien show. Yeah, or, yeah, late night stuff. Yeah, late night. That's a, a cool gig. Let me tell you, that was a fun internet black hole to get stuck in for a while, uh, looking up some of the stuff that you've done in the past. It was, it. was I've seen a few of them before, just you yeah. know, naturally watching what have you, but uh, before you come on the show, I like to research the guest and do stuff like that. And yeah, that was a fun black hole to get get stuck in. You look oh, a little I gotta different. I got some new stuff in. I got some. I got a bunch of video from the new album that I got to put on because most of my stuff is so old. I had long hair and no beard. Exactly. Yeah, and so yeah, that pe- Comedy Central special. <laughs> yeah, people will come to the show and like they won't realize it's me until like halfway through the show. They're like, "Oh, that, that really is him. <laughs> look like a di- look like a different person." Maybe if you did it upside down, so your beard would be your hair, ah. and switch it. If I could just, if I could just tilt my head, there if I could just rip are. it around, yeah, that's me. <laughs> but you know, uh, this this last week or this week actually uh, uh, just came out today. The uh, my topic was uh, Billy the Kid. I love westerns. Nice. And so that's the list I made for you guys. And actually, after making this list, uh, it's a list of outlaws. I found some of them so fascinating. I kind of wish I would have went with uh, a few of these guys as opposed to Billy the Kid. I love Billy the Kid, but some of these other guys, I was like, oh, wow, man, I had no idea. Adam, how would you like to turn into an idiot? Uh, I'm not sure I follow. For our new sponsor, Village Idiot Pub, the 5K. Oh, yeah. Village Idiot Pub in historic Cocoa Village is holding an event for the Children's Hunger Project called... 
The village has lost its idiot again. The run is a 5K held right in front of Village Idiot Pub on Harrison Street in Cocoa. It's an event to raise money and awareness for the Children's Hunger Project. While you can run, you don't have to. You can walk, skip, or drink your way to the end. So bust out those costumes, bedazzlers, and sequins and get creative, as there will be awards for the best-dressed fool or idiot. The theme is Masquerade Ball. Also, you've heard them on Living Podcariously do a performance, as well as guesting on the Twisted Ten. Our friends of the podcasts, Hot Pink, will be performing for the Village Idiot at 7 p.m. This 5K is not a timed event. It's a fun run. It's really about having fun and raising some beers. I mean, money for the Children's Hunger Project. Village Idiot Pub has over 30 beers on tap, including ciders as well as Hefeweizens, my favorite, hundreds of bottle choices, and a great selection of wine. So get your friends together for the run, then enjoy the board games, puzzles, and giant Jenga inside, as well as Hot Pink's performance. Jason and the rest of the staff are awesome and will take excellent care of you. Mention either one of our shows to the staff and get 10% off your tab. You can catch the entire cast from Living Pod Curiously as well as the Twisted 10 there on April 1st for this run. I'm thinking we should set up mics and let our listeners and the people at Village Idiot add some commentary. Ooh, that could be dangerous. <laughs> the Village Idiot run will be on April 1st, directly in front of the Village Idiot Pub on Harrison Street in Coco, directly across from the big park. Visit Village Idiot Pub on Facebook for full event details. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, all three engines up and burning, 2, 1, 0, and lift off. 5, 10, 3, 4! You're listening to the Twisted 10, bringing you original and unique post-created top 10 list recorded live in world-famous Cocoa Beach, Florida with hosts. Jack Van Sickle and Adam Poston. All right, welcome to another episode of The Twisted Ten. I'm your host. Uh, actually, I'm not your host this week, but I'm one of the regular hosts on the show. My name is Adam. Uh, if you're a first time listener to The Twisted Ten, this is a unique and original top 10 list podcast. The hosts or guest hosts, in some cases, come up with their own ideas for uh, the top 10 list and bring it to the show for us to listen to, tear apart, commentate on, etc. So uh, again, my name's Adam. I'm not your host this week. Uh, sitting on the Lady Chase, of course. Hi, I'm Andrea Joy. Are you I the, am not your host this week. You're not the host week. this week either? No, right. not the stress of making a list this week. We are missing <laughs> tack this, <laughs> we're missing tack this week. So uh, he is uh, off doing SpaceX kind of stuff. And sitting on the other uh, chair in tax place this week? It is Jay Alvarez, and I am another just curious bystander this week, I guess. Oh, yeah. You know, when we started doing this type of podcast, we realized that the week of being it wasn't necessarily a good thing because it does require a ton of research, but (laughs) it's still fun to do. So I'd like to introduce our guest host for this week. Uh, this week, we have got Mr. Dan Cummins hosting The Twisted Ten. Oh, Yay! thank you. Yeah, welcome, Dan. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for having me, man. I uh, I feel like all I do is research right now. But, uh, <laughs> this was, uh, yeah, I was researching for an episode for my, my own podcast, Time Suck. I was H.H. H. Holmes, this uh, serial killer back in the uh, Chicago's World's Fair, and then I got a bonus episode about the Third Reich, so I've been researching Hitler. A lot of dark stuff. Wow. Holy so, <laughs> so it was actually... <laughs> That's got to be an interesting Google search history now. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, my, yeah. my it, It's uh, when I'm at coffee shops doing my research, I almost just want to like, 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 like I have like books with swastikas on them, like Hitler <laughs> research, and I have, like serial killer stuff on my screen. It's like, I'm sure I make people, and I look creepy, so I'm sure I make people real nervous. So... <laughs> Uh, so for our listeners, we, we've got Dan uh, on Skype with us. He's out in L.A. right now. We can actually see the sun behind him in the background a little bit. You know, actually, I'm in Idaho. I was in L.A. I'm living in, uh, I just moved to Coeur d'Alene, and so I am looking out. It looks sunny the way that it's set up behind me. Uh, in front of me, it's actually snowing, so I'm jealous of where you guys are. Wow. So hold on, because I've, I've actually driven through Coeur d'Alene. I had a, I had a oh, long yeah. and storied history as a truck driver for a little while. How are you loving it up there? Because I've always wanted to just <laughs> stop the truck and abandon it on the side of 90. <laughs> You know, <laughs> Coeur, Coeur d'Alene is, I'm from Idaho originally, and Coeur d'Alene, like, I'm from a little kind of dumpy town in central Idaho. Uh, you know, I love it, but it's, it's no place I would want to live. It's like 400 people, middle of nowhere, and Coeur d'Alene was always looked at as like the, 
the the hoity toity fancy town of Idaho, like the jewel. Yeah, it's it is beautiful. It's so nice. Like uh, I I 